Okay, Chris. Chris, we're doing a wonderful program on Friday. We have two fairy tales coming up at our next presentations. Um, the Handless Maiden is being presented this coming Friday. Um, and it's um, three of the board members have joined together to create both an artistic evening and um, a Jungian perspective on this fairy tale. Elric Walker will tell the story. I will present uh, a set of pieces by Brahms on the piano, which are chosen as an uh, emotional analog of the story. I think, I think you'll find it quite effective if you can come. Um, that will be followed by commentary by Penny and Elric and discussion. And refreshments following. So, and it's the handless maiden. The handless maiden. There's a map on the back. It is at another place because we need a piano. It's called the Community Music Center on South Street. It's really just a couple blocks from here. And there's also an excellent map on the website if you're interested. And um, please join us next Friday. The following program. You're going to announce the following program. Yes, I'm going to do that. And Diane, we're doing a film and discussion group again for four, four um, <coughs> at the Amherst, uh, what is it called? The Amherst Pioneer Co Housing. Valley Co -housing. Pioneer Valley Co Housing in Amherst. So, Diana, you want to say a few words about that? Yeah. Hi, I'm Diana Allen. I'm a volunteer with um, the Young Association of Western Mass. And last spring we did a film and discussion group, which was really a great experience. We got together in a group of about 20 people, watched about a half an hour clip of the film, and then had a discussion after with Erica Lorenz present, Jungian analyst. We're going to be doing that again this year. The dates are February 10th, February 24th, March 3rd, and March 10th. Those are Sunday afternoons from 3 to 5. And Andy has offered uh, a space in the Pulpit Hill, uh, Pioneer Valley co-housing in Amherst, so we'll be in Amherst for that. It's pretty full, it filled up very quickly. There were a couple emails sent out, but I still can take people's names if you're interested, because some people can't come to all four, and you don't need to come to all four. If you just wanted to come to one, um, and there was room, that would be great. So should I give my email now, or do you want to come see me after? Or what? They come see you after. You come find me after. It's on. Done. It's on our email. It was on the last email that went out um, about announcing the lecture. So you can find me from there too if you'd like to sign up for more information. Um, and then we're also starting in April going to do a four uh, four study groups. This will be on Sundays too, and Daphne's going to talk about that. Hi, I'm Daphne Slocum. I'm another volunteer. The study group will be once a month, April, May, June, and July, and we're focusing on the archetypes. We'll take um, one archetype or a pair of archetypes each time. People will be welcome to bring material that they found. We're looking at how the archetypes impact and show up in our lives. So people can contribute things that they've found that have really impacted them and share them with the group. Um, and Erica will also be facilitating these. And we'll be announcing the exact dates and location and so on in the email newsletter that you hopefully are all signed up for. So you'll be hearing more about that. Look out for that if you're interested. Okay. And I just want to say Sky Karen is our videographer. Why don't you stand up? And if you ever need anything videoed, she's available for a, a very reasonable price. So, okay. And to, today I also want to honor, hold on, <laughs> sorry, a very, very important uh, board member who has decided she needs to get off the board <coughs> for a while. Carol, you want to come up? Aww. She has helped form this community. <coughs> She worked very hard with Dan, our webmaster, and I, and bringing in people, and she's our community diva. <laughs> and we hope she doesn't quit, quit being our community diva, because we need 
an Italian hostess, because the rest of us are introverted. So here's a gift and a card. Thank you for Sure. Shall she open it? How can you say no? Okay. Yeah, don't open it. Okay. Thank you. And um, uh, we usually go to the Mosaic Cafe after this to just have some some tea or some something to eat, and then just talk further and have further discussion. Do you think you're going to go? With it or you go uh, as long as my back lets me. As long as his back lets me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will be going. So does everybody know where the Mosaic Cafe is on Masonic Street? Um, it's the Academy of Music, right? Everybody know where the and then Masonic Street is the is the uh, street to the left. Just past just the, the right there. just past across from the Academy of Music and the Mosaic Cafe is down on the left. It's not very far. Okay. All right, so and Ed has books for sale over there. Mm -hmm. So afterwards, I guess people will yep. be selling books afterwards. Yes. Okay. And our next lecture is another fairy tale: the revisiting the Beauty and the Beast. It's Anita's, our elder analyst, her favorite fairy tale. And so, um, in the first Friday, we're going back to Fridays. We only do one Sunday a year. Friday, the first Friday, she will be doing. Um, Beauty and the Beast, and we really appreciate it if you can take a flyer, if you li especially if you live in the hill towns, because we don't get up there, mm -hmm. put it at a co-op, a church, a community space. We really appreciate that, because that's a way to get the word out. Erica, could you say the date of those two separate events yeah. again? This is next Friday, the, the fairy tale piano performance piece. The 11th. The 11th. At the Northampton. Yeah, at the Northampton Music School, right? And this is here at Seely Hall, a regular lecture, the first Friday of February. Okay. And all right, so now Ed Tick. So uh, he's a new member of our board, and he's a new member of our community. He and, and Kate, his wife, moved to Belchertown about five years ago, but he just mm -hmm. sort of came out and surfaced in the last <laughs> year. And uh, he's got an amazing background. He's an archetypal therapist. Mm -hmm. And he's done a lot of work with veterans and shamanic work and ritual and archetypal work. <coughs> and he's the, the uh, director of Soldier's Heart, which works with veterans. And he also guides, sometimes, dream, dream retreats to Greece. Yes. So, mm -hmm. And he's a scholar of Greek, of Greece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. mm -hmm. all right, so, take it away, Andy. Okay. <laughs> oh, sure, for, for the video, I guess so. Sure, turn it down. It sounds like the sound is very good. Is it too loud? It's a little loud. It's not. It's a little loud. Yeah. And, and I'm whispering. That's true. We need more. Can, can we turn this gentle, the sound? Keep talking. Okay. <laughs> That's easy for me. <laughs> uh, I thought I was an introvert for most of my life, but then Thayer has really been picking on me to look at that more closely. So I'm not an introvert, I'm a wounded extrovert. <laughs> so that's me. Is that better? Is, is this a, how's the sound now? Perfect. Okay. okay. Um, please, I get passionate about this material, and so I may, my voice may rise a lot, and so let me know if you need me or the microphone to quiet down. <laughs> Oops. Oh. Okay, so I'd just like to start just as a person, and see, as your friend and neighbor, before I get into the material, if I may. Um, first of all, I'm very grateful to the Young Society for welcoming me and Kate and embracing us and embracing our work, and especially grateful to my elder and our community mentor and guru Thayer. So thank you all for really for embracing me and our work and this work. Uh, in the mental, the general mental health community, archetypal work is not very understood or welcomed, as we all know. So. 
to have a community that values, really values and practices the soul work is really important. And that's helped us come home here. Um, I have some old friends and colleagues here, and I'll ask you to introduce yourself in a few minutes, but I need to be a little more personal. Um, I'd like to start with a, a, a true story. Um, there's a Japanese Buddhist monk who was assigned the duty of tending a remote Zen monastery in the Himalaya mountains in Tibet. And he was the only monk present. This was a very remote monastery and very difficult to get to. So the staff was one monk, monk and one assistant. And he was there for years and he became uh, ill and crippled there. Well, an American pilgrim made his way to the monastery, met the monk, and said, Oh my goodness, you're crippled. You're trapped here. Yes, my son, but you're from Japan. Yes, my son, that's really far away. You'll never get back. That's right, my son. Um, well, then you're trapped here. You're stuck here. You'll never see your family. You'll never see your friends. You'll never see your teachers again. Uh, you have no choice. You're really stuck. How do you feel? And the monk just smiled and said, Exactly, my son. I'm happy because I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult lesson. So in my work, and, and Kate, my partner and wife, um, we've been traveling all over the country. I lead healing, we lead healing and reconciliation journeys back to Vietnam every year. Been back 18 times. We'll share some about that. Uh, I train in the military, I work all over the country, and here I am, I've become disabled. Uh, I'm stuck in the valley. I really can't travel. I hope that'll change, but I can't travel much. It's really painful. Um, and forgive me, if you hear me moan and groan and curse during our presentation, it's probably because of my back. Um, if it's not, I'll let you know. <laughs> and four-letter words, and you know, that's their soul talk. So really important, and especially working with warriors and vets. Their talk is not the same as our polite civilian discourse. So that might come out. I may have to go back and forth between standing and sitting. I may have to take some pain meds. So uh, forgive and tolerate all that, please. I'm very happy to be with you. And. It seems seriously like uh, Kate and I, like that, not as bad as that monk, but we're stuck in the valley because we really can't travel much. So um, we have to rebuild the way we work. We're working, doing distant work, and we're doing beginning uh, local therapy, and consulting and teaching work as well. So you're our friends and neighbors. We're happy to be here. We're happy to bring ourselves and our work and um, help us be happy in the valley, <laughs> if you can. Okay. <clears throat> Oops. Okay. So, thank you all for coming, all you old friends and new friends, and all the people interested in archetypal work, and people also, you know, some people are here because you're warriors, or you work with warriors and veterans, and you're interested in that work. And so, today's presentation, I hope, will put the, warrior, the world of the warriors and, and the world of the archetypes together for you and demonstrate for all of us that the warrior is a living archetype in all of us, developed most intensively, obviously, uh, through the military and also in significantly, significantly skewed and dangerous ways. So the American warrior archetype that emerges is not the same as the pure good archetype of higher service that we all study and on. So we'll be looking at the archetype of the warrior and our military and how military service and combat are archetypal experiences and how to reframe the wound that we call post-traumatic stress disorder into a soul to really understand what it truly is, which is a soul, comprehensive soul wound that's changed us, initiated us into the underworld and birthed a very new and different person. And we call the change PTSD. Mm -hmm. And we call it breakdown. And we call it failure and disorder. And that's wrong. <laughs> it's really misdirected and misguided and it doesn't work. It keeps our 
warriors trapped in a wound instead of guiding them to health. So that's my quick introduction. That's what we're going to be doing. I probably have much more material than we can cover today, so I may skip some material or go quickly. Also, please do share questions and comments as we go along. Uh, not too long so I can get through the material, but let's all share and discuss, and I hope there'll also be time later um, at the end for more discussion. So, oops, the archetype of the warrior. Uh, when, how many of us have been to Native American powwows? Okay, about half. We remember at powwow, the first thing that's done always, like in any spiritual community, is to evoke spirit. To evoke spirit. And the second thing done at powwow always is to call the warriors forth to be recognized and honored by the community for the protection and service they give. So I've chosen this prayer to start. Uh, in the archetypal world and in the world of warriors, we really need transpersonal help. These wounds are so deep and so comprehensive, uh, we need to appeal to the divine and awaken transpersonal energies and connections in us. So we'll begin with this peace prayer of St. Francis, which we probably all know the peace prayer, yeah? You've heard this? So let's recite it together and then hear where it comes from and how it came to us. So please join me. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. And where there is darkness, light and where there is sadness, joy. Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. 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 So how many of us know that St. Francis was a warrior, a wounded warrior? Okay. Just a few, but now we all know it. And it's important, and it's important that we know where this story, uh, this prayer comes from. Oops, stay with us. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> briefly, St. Francis uh, lived around the year 1200, so 800 years ago. Uh, and we all know he was from a middle-class mercantile family, and the family wanted him to take over the family business, and he was 20 years old, and like most 20 years old, he said, are you kidding? I don't work in a store, I want adventure. He went off to war at age 20, uh, and he was in combat against another city-state for about a year, and then he was captured, so he was a prisoner of war in 1200, miserable, horrible, torturous conditions, his family ransomed him back after that year and said, okay, you're home now, it's over, get on with life, come on into the family business. You think he did, or he could? What did he do? Just like our warriors today, he re-upped. He went off for a second combat deployment. And during that second deployment, he had serious spiritual breakdown. He went home, and that's when he took the pauper's robes on and took up his begging and uh, devoted himself to the spiritual service we all know about. Um, he rebuilt old holy sites, we know that. He worked with the lepers and the poor and the destitute, and guess what? The traumatized warriors, and many of his first followers were other wounded warriors. And he wrote, he confronted authority, remember you confronted the Pope, live up to the Christian ideals, and during the crusade, he went and met with um, Saladin. Yes, thank you. The commander of the Muslim forces and tried to talk both sides into peace. He didn't end the crusade, but he had the courage and he crossed the, the battlefield and got to the other side and had a very serious and hard tough talk with him. So Francis was actually a great warrior who turned his wounds into lifelong service that we honor now. And we know he left us many beautiful prayers and poems and blessings, but not this one. Not this one. Um, during World War I, a 
chaplain found a lost or discarded Bible in the mud and blood of the front line trenches. And in that Bible was the St. Francis prayer card. And on the back of the card, in pencil, in an unsteady hand, was written this prayer. Some unknown soldier in World War I, meditating on St. Francis, came out of World War I trenches with this vision for us. And the chaplain was wise and loving enough to have it translated into every language of every country on both sides fighting and distributed thousands of copies. And that's how we have the St. Francis prayer. And you see it's a gift of two wounded warriors. Transcendent vision coming out of wounded warriors. So uh, just a little bit about me and, and my work um, shared with somebody. Where are you, CEO, who served in the hospital today? Or what's your name again? Gregory. Gregory. Uh, Gregory and I were sharing um, about the same age, and we're both uh, eligible for Vietnam service, and we both were applying for CO instead, conscientious objector. And Gregory served for five years in uh, VA hospital for his service. Um, I was applying for conscientious objector during Vietnam, and I was willing to go as a medic um, in the legacy of my, uh, my godfather and uncle, who was a medic at the Battle of the Bulge. And I got a high lottery number and didn't have to go. And what we call moral injury today, of course, the whole Vietnam War was moral injury to everybody. But that, in addition, was a moral injury to me and the people who didn't have to serve. Because you don't have to do anything. You're off the hook. People are killing and dying over there. But some of you are going to suffer, and some of you can just go on with life. So I was looking for my form of alternative service. And um, I lived in a rural part of uh, central New York State as a young beginning therapist in 1975. And the vets started to come to see me. And at the time, everybody was scared, and nobody knew how to work with them, and I was warned not to. They're too dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, wow, I can give service. I can be, give the CO service that I wanted to give. And like my uncle, I can strive to be a home front doc. So that's what I've been doing uh, for over 40 years now. And uh, I do write and work with our veterans from the archetypal or psycho-spiritual perspective. I affirm that we absolutely need um, profound soul work in order to transform and heal from the wounds of war. And I'm happy to say um, that I've gone from a frontline war protesting hippie to an expert on military war warfare working closely with uh, our military. And it's an extraordinary and unusual journey, and I'm very proud to have made it and to bring back some of the lessons for all of us. So that's enough about me for now. My books are available. The other way. But this is also about you, so how is this about me, about you? I'm glad you're all here, and I hope each of you is asking yourself, why did you come? What does this mean to you? Why did you choose to spend the Sunday afternoon this way? So, um, Kate and I have a tiny little exercise that's always quite revealing. And we want to know who's here and you know, ask, have you ask yourself why. So, we're talking about um, warrior service and the soul wounding that comes from war. And we want to know who's here. So, uh, we'll, it's kind of uncomfortable. We'll just raise our hands. Are there any active duty military present here today? No. Any reservists? Guard? Okay. None. It's very important. We're a representative population. Let's see what's in this, in this demographics. No active duty or reserve people present. How many veterans? Will you veterans please raise your hands? Look around, folks. We've got... It doesn't mean if you served in the military, not just if you were in war. Right. We're not asking combat veterans. We're asking all veterans. Okay, so please everybody look around and see. Uh, we have, I'm not going to count, but we have maybe a little higher proportion of veterans uh, in our group than on the streets. How about what we call um, Warriors for Peace? Activists who really gave a lot and sacrificed and got hurt in trying to help things go well. 
Come on. <laughs> Thank you. About the same number of veterans, and of course, many of our veterans are also peace and social justice activists. Okay, do we have spouses or ex-spouses or widows or widowers of veterans? I want everybody to keep your hand up. The ones who have already raised your hand, keep them up. So yeah, we so we see what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Do we have parents of veterans or active duty people right now? We do have it. We have a mother somewhere. Yes. We do. We have a parent of two vets. Two. Hmm? Yeah, two. Yeah. two, yeah. See, two. Okay. Um, children and veterans? Oh. Yeah, well, you know, just about every one of us. You might have to put two hands up. Right. And <laughs> grandchildren and veterans? Uh huh. And veterans in uh, and war in your ethnic, religious, cultural heritage? It's all been carried here, right? Okay. Um, do we have any grandparents? Of Veterans here, we're, some of us were old enough for that. You know. Friends and neighbors, yeah, everybody. Teachers, professors, helpers, mm -hmm. okay. Siblings. All right, and siblings. So, has everybody raised their hand? Or at least one of the categories? Okay, so we see that all of us are touched. It's occasionally, in groups when we do this, uh, people don't raise their hand and they claim they have no connection whatsoever. So then we ask, whoops, the last question. Uh, do you pay taxes? <laughs> you pay taxes, you pay the bill, you buy the bullets, you're responsible also. We're all responsible for what happens to our money. So, okay, so we could uh, stop now and just break up into small groups and talk about how war and veterans uh, have affected us and our lives, but we're not going to do that today, maybe in the future. But the important thing is to know and affirm we are all touched and we're all involved. And it's, um, it's a moral injury to our nation that we're not always talking about war because we're always in it. You know, Israel um, reports 1% PTSD rate even though everybody in Israel is traumatized and they're living in a constant war zone. And one of the, there are many reasons, but one of them is because they're always, always, always talking about it and debating it, and the people feel like they have a say in what happens. And that's been taken away from us. Or, and we haven't been participating, and we have. So, this is all ours, and we're in a good community that cares. So, I'd like to start with another story. Um, this statue is called the Wounded Warrior, and it's in uh, the Archaeological Museum in Athens. It's from 300 BC. It was found on the island of Delos, a sacred island where only religious and spiritual practices were allowed. So something about wounded warriors and their healing also happened on this island. And when we leave, take my lead trips to both Greece and Vietnam, I hope I can still do that. Um, planning to. Uh, so we take our groups and often our veterans um, can see this statue and when our vets stand in front of the statue they say, that's me, that's me inside, that's just how I feel. And if we look at the statue not as broken statuary but also as a metaphor, this is a wounded warrior. He's wounded right across the heart, broken heart. His body is it's still intact and he's still trying to defend himself and fight. The warriors keep serving even no matter what, they're wounded. But look, as we say, his legs were cut out from under him. The legs are gone, he can barely stand anymore. And look at his head and his face. His heart is broken and his face is distorted. So, you know, cognitively, intellectually, he's also changed and challenged and wounded. And our vets just look at that and they say, that's a portrait of me, I understand utterly. So I want to tell you a story um, from early in my practice. It's actually the opening story in my book, War in the Soul. Um, it's an important teaching lesson for all of us. This is way back in a, about, oh, thank you. Um, somewhere around late, the late 1970s, 79, 80, um, I was working 
with a Vietnam combat veteran named Art. And Art was at the siege of Khe Sanh. Some of us remember that long, horrible uh, four-month siege and way out in the middle of nowhere, <coughs> many casualties on both sides. Art was there the entire siege. Uh, and this is what he described to me. Um, he was a machine gunner on the perimeter. And there were horrible bombardments back and forth from both sides. And Art said, during the bombardments, I could feel my soul trying to get out of my body and get away from this. He said, you know, you, your soul's a living thing. Art was from the Catskill Mountains, from the boonies, uneducated, not religious. This talk was just purely from his experience. We look for embodied work, right? The soul in the body and in our experience. This guy knew. His soul came to the surface. So, he said, you know, your soul is attached to your body by an invisible umbilical cord of energy. And you can't feel it until it wants to break. And so during the bombardments, I crawl into my foxhole and get into the fetal position as small as I can. And just to try to hold my soul into my body from keeping it, from running away. So one day Art said, uh, I was on the perimeter behind my machine gun and the enemy mounted a suicide charge. So hundreds and hundreds of people willing to die, charging at him and his squad. He was firing and firing and firing, and while he was firing, he was screaming, Go home! Stop! I don't want to do this to you, you don't want to do this to me, nobody wants to kill each other, we all have families, let's just stop and go home! So he's screaming that while he's shooting and killing. And this is, where's our picture? Um, Whoops. Okay. This is part of this description. The head and the heart break apart under these conditions. Uh, and a rack veteran named Mike said, we don't need all your fancy uh, definitions and explanations of PTSD. I'll tell you what it is. PTSD is when your head tells you to do what your heart tells you is wrong. When your head tells you to do what your heart tells you is wrong. And Art was saying, this is wrong, I don't want to do it. But he's shooting and shooting and shooting to save his life and his comrades. So, the battle's going on and um, the enemy overran the, the perimeter and the position and his entire squad retreated while he was still trying to hold his position. Finally, he heard his sergeant screaming, come up the hill, join the rest of us. And he, then he said, that's when it happened, that's when it happened. My soul jumped out of my body and ran up that hill faster than a human being can move. I was surrounded by enemy soldiers. There were bullets flying all over the place. I should have been dead a million times over, but I got up the hill without a scratch. Then he looked at me and said, talk to you, believe me? I said, of course I believe you. There is such a thing as soul loss. Souls can be wounded, souls can be lost, souls can leave the body. Uh, and the good news is that the cord didn't break. Your soul wanted you still to be here. And he went, Phew. I thought docs didn't talk about souls. <laughs> and I've never found one before you would. So yes, sir, soul loss, loss is real. Traditional cultures knew about this. And we'll, if you're willing, we'll work together to try to make your life a safe place for your soul to move back in. But then I turned to, oh, I asked him, where is your soul now? Did it come back? He said, no, it's in this empty chair next to us, watching you, deciding if it's going to trust you. So I turned to the empty chair, and I bowed. And I said, bless you, and thank you for being Art's guardian spirit, and thank you for getting him out of that battle and back safely to us. And now, let's all three of us work together to try to make this life, this world, a safe place. And we did. But um, that was a transformational meeting for me because, uh, you know, I, just, I knew the soul was wounded and crying out, but he was the first veteran I met, and it was toward the beginning of my work, who really was willing to do soul work and talk soul talk and show, demonstrate to me as a beginning therapist that this was the way to navigate the underworld that our warriors have been through.
And then I, from then on, since then, I've been investigating how to do that. And Kate and I have been practicing it. So I'd like to, this is a very brief survey that could take hours and hours mm -hmm. uh, from uh, lessons from the chiefs of old. <coughs> Guardians, teachers, uh, practitioners of this path that we've had through history that teach us uh, how to navigate it. So, King David. Um, King David had a severe case of what we call PTSD. And if you go back to the Psalms, there's 150 Psalms, and half, fully half of them, 75 or more Psalms, are Psalms of abject spiritual suffering and anguish. Uh, and here we have an excerpt from Psalm 22. Sounds like a PTSD description. My God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? I'm poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. Uh, my heart is like wax. Finally, at the end of the psalm, he tells us why he's suffering so much. Rescue my soul from the sword. Rescue my soul from the sword. If we go back and study David's life, I did um, case studies of both King David and King Saul uh, in my second book, Warriors Return. Um, both of them were severe cases, we would say today. Um, Dave, uh, in both families, there was incest, there was murder, there was competition. Uh, they killed holy people. Um, David, of course, was Saul's music therapist. The only thing that calmed him down was David playing the harp. Uh, but then Saul turned against David and tried to kill him. Um, so the terrible, terrible dysfunction in both people and both families. So our Judeo-Christian tradition begins with two tra severely traumatized warrior kings. And we all know tra uh, trauma is historical, transpersonal, transgenerational. It's built into our civilization, into our religions, into our way of thinking from the beginning. David used faith to project himself through. So after Psalm 22 comes the beautiful Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And he did walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And sometimes faith and praise were what he used to project himself out of despair. And it worked sometimes for him. Uh, I do have my warriors, if they're willing, read psalms and write their own. Write your own PTSD psalms. Talk to God. Speaking of talking to God, George Washington also had what we would call PTSD. Uh, Washington, you remember, was in the French and Indian Wars before the Revolution, so he spent about a decade of his life in war. Um, we are told that he, he lost his first four battles as a young man in the French and Indian War. Two of them were massacres. The biographers tell us that he heard the screams of the wounded and the dying for the rest of his life. And in public, he kept it together. He was quiet and regal and bearing, but Martha tells us it wasn't like that at home. He didn't sleep well. He had nightmares. He had a huge explosive temper that he lost control of occasionally. So the father of our country also had the wound. And he knew spirituality was necessary. Uh, he created the chaplain corps at the very beginning of the revolution. Um, we've had chaplains, uh, in the United States military have had chaplains since the first shot. Chaplain William Emerson, the grandfather of Ralph Waldo Emerson, was a Congregationalist minister in Lexington, and he was on the bridge with the Minutemen tending them when the very first shots were fired. And it was Chaplain Emerson that Washington appointed as the first chaplain. Uh, he was at Fort Ticonderoga, and he died during that winter in service. Um, Washington said in his original charge to chaplains, the blessing and protection of heaven are at all times necessary, but especially in times of danger and distress. Washington, he didn't go to church, and he didn't practice uh, conventional religion too much. He was a Freemason, um, and he actually he didn't pray this way. <laughs> this is a beautiful, romanticized prayer um, picture as praying at Valley Forge, um, but he used to stand up and pray this way. This way, he appealed. He also kept a prayer journal, and he wrote in it every day to give himself strength, which I also asked my veterans to do. 
find a way to pray and ritualize every single day so the demonic energies can be at bay. Okay, the Lakota people, the Sioux, we call them, they call what we call PTSD, they call Nahinapeapi in their language, which means the spirits left. The spirits left. Well, if the spirits left, the warrior, what's healing? Restoring the spirit. They had extensive spiritual practices for restoring spirit to uh, wounded warriors. And um, that's the prescription. And um, my grandfather, Sitting Bull, great teacher and grandfather to me, he said, He's famous as being a warrior and a chief, we all know that, but he had many other roles in, among his people. And he said, the most important role I played for my people that held the tribe together, that did more for my people than anything else, was that I was medicine chief of the Hunk Papa Warrior Society. If our warriors are well, our people will be well. George Washington said the same thing. If the warriors are well, the community, the people will be well. If the warriors go down, we all go down. So Sitting Bull said, tending the warriors as a spiritual elder, as a medicine man, was more important than anything else he did. And his job, as well as other medicine people, was to restore spirit. And one more elder that you wouldn't have heard of, probably. Um, I make an altar whenever I do this work for strength. And uh, this is my father's World War II Bible. Uh, these were given out to all troops then. Um, it opens with a very brief message from Franklin Roosevelt, Commander-in-Chief, and it closes on the very last page with a message from um, Major General William Arnold, who was uh, Chief of Chaplains all during World War II. Parenthetically, he was also the very first Catholic Chief of Chaplains that the United States ever had. Uh, and these are his closing words to all of the troops going off to World War II. A soldier who knows the word of God and honestly tries to observe divine laws is a person of power and influence and exalts military service to the high level of religious faith, courage, and wonder. Okay. Beautiful, inspiring. What if you can't? What if you're an atheist? What if you decide that the war, or the particular war you are in, is a betrayal of God's laws? And what if you don't believe in your service and you can't exalt it to the high level of faith? That's moral injury. That's what we have in our wars. No offense to anyone here. I'm not telling anybody what to believe. We have many veterans. But the point is that Military service and combat especially are ex inherently moral arenas, inherently. And morality is inherently involved and wounding inherently happens. We can't engage in war without this injury to the soul. Yes, you want to say that? What about God's law, thou shalt not kill? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, the, that's an important question, and the commandment actually in proper translation is not thou shalt not kill. The commandment is thou shalt not murder. Serious, uh, careful considerations in the Old Testament uh, differentiating murder from killing. Okay, And the Old Testament, if we look at those laws as the divine laws we've been asked to follow, they say that killing is allowed and is not a sin and not a moral injury uh, for self-defense, um, for wars, moral wars um, approved by your leadership. So war is allowed in the New Testament. And the third uh, is capital punishment is allowed for heinous crimes that really destroy the community. So the commandments that shall not murder and it allows wars if they're justified. So just as a follow-up question, was murder a big problem back in the biblical era of the yeah. people like so, recklessly murdering and so they had to make that a commandment? Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, as soon as civilizations got large and competitive, um, all of the modern crimes that we know entered, uh, came with civilization. It just, it just occurs to me that the, one of the great moral wounding that happens in all war is to make that decision as an individual. Oh, God, yes. When, mm -hmm. Is it murder or is it self-defense? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing. Exactly. Yes, so... Particularly in modern war, very yeah. difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you know veterans from any of our modern wars, Elric's making a really important point. Very, very many of the veterans suffer over this question. Did I kill or did I murder? And they often don't know. Uh, and so we have to struggle with them to help. Um, as a chaplain in West, Walter Reed, I lectured at Walter Reed, and a chaplain said, I've come to understand that my job now is to help our warriors renegotiate their covenant with the divine because they feel they have sinned. And they have to get good with God even <coughs> taking life. Yeah, boss. <laughs> um, I struggled with this issue very directly when I was 18 years old in the infantry and um, was trained to kill in about 10 different ways and thrown into combat. And what posed the issue in the most profound way was when our unit liberated the Nordhausen concentration camp, which I've talked about here in previous times. And I was exposed to a thousand corpses. Um, and guards that had fled, and the German troops, thank God, had fled, or I wouldn't be sitting here. And um, the choice is, do I kill in response to what I've seen as abysmal evil? Uh, I am the son of a congregational minister. I wasn't raised to kill, but in that situation it became very clear to me that my moral choice was to kill those who had created such e evil. And I wrote home to my parents that evening after the battle and said, now I know why I must be here and do what mm -hmm. I have to do. Mm -hmm. So this is a profound soul choice that so many of us in combat, one form or another, it's changed quite a lot since the Second World War, but the choice is there, and uh, it's why, to me, the Vietnam War was such a moral catastrophe for so many, uh, and it has demonstrated that the Vietnamese did not have PTSD, because for them it was the survival of their culture and their family and their land. Mm -hmm. But for us, it was an immoral invasion. But that was not true in the war I fought in. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes called a good war, there is no <laughs> such thing. Just to let you know, for every year of peace in the world since 500 BC, there have been 13 years of war. Mm -hmm. So, in the large scope, yes, war is with us, is part of us, has been with us for ever and dominated human history. Um, there's, <coughs> statistics are accurate. Um, 
since the invention of writing, so uh, 5,000 years ago. Uh, there are 15,000 recorded wars in 5,000 years. Um, but um, on a more personal level, Thayer is sharing accurately the profound moral struggle that people in combat have and how he resolved it. Um, Thayer had a con confrontation with pure evil and then changed from I am a pacifist raised not to kill to I am a warrior who must tragically kill in order to try to stop this evil. There's a profound spiritual and identity transformation that occurred and it has been with him forever. And he's been serving us all forever out of that new identity. We'll pick on him a little more later. Yeah. Bless you, Sarah. Thank you. So we see we have all these lessons from our elders that from St. Francis and the Unknown Soldier, a redemptive vision must come emerge from our suffering. From David, faith and devotion must protect us and carry us through. George Washington, we need spirituality during danger. We must protect our warriors and our nation's souls. And from Chaplain Arnold, be spiritually empowered and exult in your service. And again, if we can't, then we are deeply wounded in the soul and our service will not sit well. So, um, yes? Um, I'm just sitting here with um, the knowledge that people like George Washington um, also were perpetrators of, um, slave, of continuing slavery yes. and um, living, living lives that were very complex and yes. that weren't you know, so I just have to speak to that, that, that there was also a lot of problems with um, a figure like Washington being seen as a, as a warrior for me. And, mm -hmm. um, well, you're right. He also um, was brutal against the Native Americans and uh, helped kick off the genocide that we've been practicing. Just like... I hear you and I agree with you. Just like King Saul and King David were traumatized warrior kings who began our tradition and were still struggling with the issues, so was Washington, a traumatized warrior king who was the first leader of this country and who brought all of those confused, challenging, difficult, immoral actions and issues right into the birth of the nation and was still struggling with all of those collectively. So, yeah. Yes. Dealing with concepts, not personalities, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I'd like to stay. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, feel, I guess we've been going for about an hour. Feel free to take a break if you need to, and then I'll get to a comfortable stopping place so we can all have a break. Okay. So, um, understanding the archetype. Um, and what an archetype is, and we're going to be looking at the archetypal dimensions of a military service and of warriorhood. And uh, in this audience, we don't have to talk about what an archetype is, we all know. But let's remember universal patterns that give us uh, images and stories and it's living dynamic energy uh, system in us. And we are the servants of the archetypes. They direct us, we don't direct them. Silly us, uh, and the myths live us, and the amazing repository of images and stories that always surface in the individual and cultures and collectively through history. And so we're working with the warrior archetype today, and with our military. And the warrior archetype is a unique archetype. It expresses itself, of course, in many different ways, as all the archetypes do, and we'll look a little bit at that. Uh, it has a unique spirituality because of its demands and dangers and challenges that it gives the individual. Um, this statue uh, is of King Leonidas, the uh, king of the Spartans, and um, oops, uh, you see the valley where he's literally on a peak overlooking um, the valley of Thermopylae where he and the 300 Spartans uh, served and fell. And Kate and I uh, bring warriors to the site and we do warrior healing ceremony right there um, at the grave of the Spartans. Uh, but this is, so this is 
one of the ways the warrior appears. The warrior archetype, of course, um, is shaped by the culture and the personality and the history and the times. And so, of course, we have many, many versions of the warrior archetype in our country. And we won't talk about it today. It's a different discussion, but we do have to meditate on how in our unfolding of the warrior archetype we went from this to this. From a Minuteman fighting, theoretically, to protect home and family and seek financial and social justice and um, militia not being paid but just wanting to protect their community. So we've gone from that, we've gone from being the indigenous Though we took the land from the indigenous people, the early people still experienced themselves as settlers and Americans invaded by the British and their mercenaries, and now we've become the other side invading all over the world. Uh, we have about a quarter million troops in 140 countries right now. 240,000 troops in 140 countries, about 30,000 special operations forces fighting in about 50 countries that we're not allowed to know about. Mm -hmm. So the war archetype is very, very strong and dominates the American psyche, but not in a positive, protective ways that we would all want and hope. Uh, but the war archetype, of course, comes out in many other ways. Our first, do we have any first responders or retired first responders present? I'm sorry I didn't include them in the group of warriors at the beginning, but our first responders are are living the warrior archetype. They are facing strife in service to the community. The word warrior comes from the old German word werle, which meant strife. A warrior is one who encounters and faces and tries to reduce strife of any form. So criminality is strife in our culture. And these are the people who walk in to face that strife and try to keep it down and under control for the rest of us. And another version of the warrior archetype, they're the first responders. They're not trying to take life, they're trying to save life. The warrior runs into danger to preserve and protect the community when most of the community runs away from danger. So in the terrible mass shootings that we've had, where people rightly ran for their lives. In the Las Vegas massacre, the veterans in the crowd turned around and ran toward the gunfire. And they hit people, and they told people how to protect themselves, and they carried out the wounded. In the Florida high school shooting, the two coaches who were killed were veterans. They turned into the guns to protect the students and to try to stop it. That's what warriors do for the rest of us. And that's what warriors are trained to do, and that's a reason we actually need warriors. Cultures need warriors in order to respond to and reduce the strife, not in order to increase it. And so, we have this definition of warrior from Grandfather Sitting Bull, Tatanki Otake, his language. Warriors are not what you think of as warriors because no one has the uh, right to take another life. It's always a moral injury to take another life, even when we have to, to stop evil, as they are shared. The warrior is one who sacrifices himself or herself for the good of others. The warrior's task is to take care of the elderly, the defenseless, those who cannot provide for themselves, and above all, the children, the future of humanity. You see, warriors preserve and protect. That's their purpose, and when we give them, when we truly give them those values and actions, it hurts, but they're okay. When we give them tasks that betray preservation and protection, that's what wounds the soul. So, you know, our Marines say, once a warrior, always a warrior, <clears throat> and once a Marine, always a Marine. Do we have any Marines? Oh, but we have warriors. Was one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, right? Always a Marine? Always. I know the Marines hymn. We sang it every day. 25 <laughs> minutes from the time I could 
<laughs> you can't get the warrior out of the personality. So when we think of PTSD as uh, um, the, the kind of cognitive wounding that can be cleaned out and taken out and we'll have uh, ordinary um, civili functioning civilians again, no, no, no. It's a one-way journey and the warrior has been awakened and has to be included in the transformation. So they can be good fathers, but they're still going to be Marines and warriors. So the warrior's journey is a lifelong journey. Once a warrior, always a warrior. And we're looking to help support our warriors in reshaping their identity so they carry it as warriors, but in the community, as some of you do with all of us. Now, back to the warrior archetype. We all know, we affirm that every archetype has its light side and its shadow side its positive traits and its negative traits. And certainly that's true about the warrior, and sometimes it's really clearly embodied and portrayed for us so we can uh, see it. And uh, of course this is from the Greek pantheon, where the Greeks had two war gods, two war deities. I'm sorry, Athena. Mm -hmm. Not a guy. So Athena, it was the protector of civilization. She was the defender. She represented the light side of the archetype. Athena grieved the necessity of war. It's a wonderful uh, and profound um, carving that we've seen at the Acropolis many times of Athena grieving, crying with her head down, saluting the dead and leaning on her spear. Athena grieves. Athena doesn't want to. But she knows we have to sometimes. Ares, on the other hand, the god of war, he's the berserker. He is, Homer said, the god who delights in slaughter. He wants to kill. He wants the charge. He wants the excitement. All oh, so many of our veterans say, you know, civilian life is boring. I want to fight. I want a high-speed motorcycle race. I want to get in every bar fight I can. Ares is still in charge in their psyche. Mm. And it's exciting. There's nothing in civilian life that approaches this charge. It's Ares. And the berserker. Some, I gotcha. Um, not all, but some of our veterans become berserk, have what our soldiers sometimes call the mad moment. And when the berserker takes over, there's no stopping it. Uh, it's pure bestiality released and caring food on the battlefield. Uh, and Ares represents that, and it does happen to some of our people. Um, certainly the Milai Massacre uh, is an example of Ares taking over. And we have many, many stories like that. Again, we can't be in war and we can't teach people how to kill without this danger of the dark side taking over. Yes? I just, you find it telling the way that their temples are set up in ancient Greece. The, 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 the Parthenon is the very center of the city of the Acropolis. Right. Ares' temple is outside the city on purpose because you can't bring that shit in civilization. That's right. <laughs> right. Thank you, and that's right. There was every city had a guardian deity, Athena for Athens, Aphrodite for Corinth. We could go through them. But no Greek, you're absolutely right. Every, the Greeks were wise enough to, so that no Greek city-state ever adopted Ares as their guardian and allowed his temples in the city. The Arapagus was always outside any city walls. Right, always. Except the Romans changed that, of course, and Ares became Mars, and Mars was second in power and importance after Jupiter. Yes, I, I, Can I, I tell my experience of Ares sure. when I was in Athens? Um, it, I was walking around below the Acropolis uh, with my English wife, and we had gone around the temple to Hephaestus. We'd been yep. circumambulating around it. And so we were in the old city, and sitting down on a bench, and all of a sudden I felt this powerful being take me over. And this being was so bloodthirsty that he was willing to do anything to win a battle even if it meant sacrificing his own child. It was, it was uh, so seductive because all at once I was just terribly powerful. And my wife looked at me and she said, Michael, stop it. And I had to let it go. I knew it wasn't me, 
Uh, but at the same time, like I said, it it it, it was something that mm -hmm. I wanted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that you wanted. You wanted that power. Yeah. You wanted we want to have that force. Well then, let, thank you, Michael, and let's ask a difficult question. Uh, how many people have had even a one-second experience like Michael is describing about being taken over by a dark force and feeling like you could kill? Okay, about about half of us. Um, how many of us, either from actual experience or because we felt this dark power, how many of us know that we could kill? It's um, two-thirds of us, okay. If we were put through the military, every one of us would know how to kill, or we would break down and not make it through. And we've some, some people with the, the traumatic wound are gentle people who couldn't make it through the military and were destroyed by, by uh, training. Uh, let's ask the other question. How many of us, well, the essence of combat, the archetypal essence, is it's not about politics, it's not about ideals, it's only when you're in the middle of it, kill or be killed. Yes. You in, are trying to keep yourself and your buddies alive and stop the other by taking their lives. So we've had, some of us have had half that experience, we know we can kill. How many of us have had the other half of the experience of, I really, really thought that moment I was going to die. So about half of us. Okay, we won't do it now, but in some of the training work that Kate and I do, we use this as an exercise where we do a kill or be killed exercise. And in five minutes, you can have a little taste of what goes on and what takes us over and the struggle to make that moral choice. Do I kill or do I not? And if I don't, then I'm dead. So this is in the archetypal essence and everyone's soul in the combat zone is put through these anguishing dilemmas. And so we might ask, why do we need to? And Michael is starting to answer it because, and there, there's evil out there. There are demonic forces that can take us over. So war itself is an archetype. War itself is an archetype, and it is so built into us, in, into our civilizations. Look, all three of our root civilizations declare that God and war are related and God is the master of war and we're always going to have it. From Exodus, the Lord is a man of, our Lord is a man of war. There are hundreds of quotes like that from the Bible. From the Greeks, might and violence in you the command of God is perfect fulfillment. War is father and king of all. And from the Norse tradition, Odin, the king God, it's the one who, uh, he shot into other gods and, and killed a relative, and that's what began wars. Yes? Really quickly. Mm. The name Odin literally means battle fury. Mad with battle fury. Ah. Uh, thank you. Everybody Can you hear that? that please? The word, the name Odin, Odin means mad with battle fury. And God is, name, is the berserker. So what do you think his warriors are supposed to do and be? Berserkers, right. And the word berserker comes from the same Greek, uh, Norse tradition. It means uh, berserker, berserk. It was uh, it meant bear shirt, and it was the name of the warriors who dressed themselves as bears and wolves and became that fierce berserkers on the battlefield. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, yes, I had a question. Yes. Uh, it, it's, could you address the issue of civilian deaths in war? Because you're talking about the... Yeah. Greek city-state wars, or the American Civil War, or the First World War, where the vast majority of casualties were soldiers fighting soldiers. The history of modern war is, is the, for every one American we lost in Vietnam, 40 Vietnamese died. In the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. they lost 27 million in World War II. Yes. And two-thirds of that were civilians. Yes. And for instance, in North Korea, we leveled North Korea, 20% of its whole the entire civilian population died. In, yes. in Poland, they lost 20% of their civilian population in World War II. So the, I mean, we, maybe this are the last, the 
when we invaded Iraq, there's estimates of maybe 600,000 to half a million civilians mm -hmm. there. Yes. So, I mean, yes. it's warriors fighting warriors, but 90% of the casualties or whatever the percentage is the right are civilians. And I think the issue mm -hmm. of warriors killing men, women and, and children in terms of your work with trauma, that mm -hmm. would be... Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure what my question is, but you know, it's like, it's, it's the civilians that are suffering that, in these wars. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you're right that uh, presently uh, in all the wars around the world, this casualty rate is 90% civilians. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, and, and others you, want to respond to this. When you work with, with, with combat veterans, mm -hmm. is that the most trauma, in, especially yes. Vietnam, when, oh, well, yeah. when they... It, Mm -hmm. When they win the hooches and shot people and their women and children in there, yes. and they had to live with that. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. You know, it's absolute. That it's important that you're bringing it up, and it's correct that killing civilians is far more traumatizing. Many of our warriors will say, uh, "I was, a pro I was a professional soldier at least for that time. I was in. I was trained to kill. Um, the job of soldiers is to get their training and go out and meet." other armed warriors in a fair fight. And when that happens, there isn't moral injury. Oh, the 600,000 well, German civilians but, who died in the bombing. I mean, okay, yeah, right, so, um, so our warriors will say, I don't feel bad about having killed another warrior who's trying to kill me, but I feel horrible about the civilians I killed. That's accurate. Um, I worked with a man who only came in for help in his 80s. His, at 18 years old, he was a World War II bombardier in the Flying Fortress. Yeah. And he came in just to say, before I die, and God sends me to hell for the rest of my life, I want to see if I can come to peace with the fact that I am a mass murderer. Mm -hmm. And everybody my whole life has been telling me, it was a good war, it was a good war, you did what you had to do. None of them get it. I'm a mass murderer. Mm -hmm. So, yes, killing civilians is a monstrous moral injury. It's going on all over the world. Uh, it's the way we practice war, and uh, your comment was right with one editorial statement, and that mine is that this started with the American Civil War, because the Civil War became a highly technological war, mm -hmm. and especially the North was inventing lots and lots and lots of monstrously destructive weapons, and war against the civilians became kosher, Sherman's march to the sea, exactly. destroy it. Everything in your path? Yeah. yeah. And then World War I came with the advance of weaponry, which was so obscene it's unspeakable. And war has been in that, in that nature ever since. So it's, it's insane, it's out of proportion, uh, and, and uh, everyone participating will be morally injured whether they are awake to it or not. And thank you for your compassion for the victims. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just want to echo what you're saying. Um, like once war became industrial strength, so to speak, mm, right. like World War One, they called that the war to end all wars. Right. And mm -hmm. we're at a point now, even if you don't talk about the morality of it, if, if you take taking seriously global warming, for instance, it's the greatest CO2 producer, mm. the Pentagon and wars. Like, like right. a, if you think of it as uh, the arena mm. of where an archetype plays, that this game has to transform the way it is played. Absolutely, you know, mm -hmm. and that the, mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the archetype of the warrior as a way to end war. Um, oh, yeah. And yes. Because what you're yes. saying about the, what a warrior does is it stops strife to preserve the community. Yes. It is actually now the cause of the strife. Yes. And when you're <laughs> yeah. talking yeah. about yeah. warrior king, you want to know where the king is because we're not questioning when you say, oh, I'm mm -hmm. shooting to protect my own life because he's shooting at me. That's an artificial creation right. that some supposed kings put people in. Yes. You don't even know that person. They yes. don't even know you. So it's, it's a, it's a, once you say um, it's not murder if I'm self-defense, but you create a, create a situation where everything is self-defense now. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And um, so I wasn't ever clear, and maybe you can talk about this later, about the difference between murder and killing. Um, but um, my, what was I going to say? One more thing. Um, that, uh, you know, there, there's a way in which that idea that it, war is sometimes necessary only in the last resort, like Athena would say. And mm -hmm. yet you said 15,000 wars in 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. So that little 
last little exception clause right. makes it happen all the time. Because everyone's always saying, this is the good war, this is the just mm -hmm. war. Right. And they have the propaganda to, to put it down. Yes. Yes. So, yes. so I'm having an issue around, well, we all are. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, we all are, and you voiced it well for us. And our warriors, our veterans had that issue too. Somebody was trying to kill me, so it was right for me to defend myself against him, but they were trying to kill me in a place I shouldn't have been, where I invaded and I'm the bad guy. So I did the moral thing in an immoral action. I don't know how to put this together. Um, so yeah, we are all in a moral quandary, whether or not we participate, for sure. And uh, you pointing that is correct, and our veterans struggle fiercely with that. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the counseling setting, uh, what they want most from us is to just be in the struggle together. Yeah. Not to have the answers, not to think we know. This is deep, dark, difficult material, mm -hmm. and we become companions in an underworld journey. Mm -hmm. Yes? I don't want this conversation to get too far into the anti-war, we're talking about war kind of stuff. But what I, I do want to say is sometimes people have asked, well, how come all the veterans you know, came home from World War II and they didn't suffer the way that the guys who came from Vietnam did? Well, we're talking about that to some extent because um, w what we do know is that it's the most psychologically damaging situation is urban warfare, where you're in cities, where there are people innocent people between you and the enemy, where the enemy is a sniper and, and you're being told that you know, your career and everything is on the line if you don't fight back, but you know that between you and that other person is all these civilians that are going to possibly get killed. And it's a, so it's a, it's a total no-win situation. We even had someone whose mother called us uh, at Soldier's Heart saying that she doesn't know what to do because her son called her on a cell phone mm -hmm. in, the, in the middle of a battle just like what I just described, and he said, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, there's no, I, I can't win here. I, I don't want to kill these people, but I have to kill these people. I got, you know, I have to risk this and everything. And then he started screaming, you know, the goddamn government put me here. It's horrible. You know, and then the phone went dead. But it's not about warriorship. It's about propaganda and making people into puppets. Right. As a, but, you know, they're just being used. It's, not, it's, it's just being used. I, I just want to say one more thing. <laughs> is that we thought that when we developed the drone technology that this would be a solution for our vets because they wouldn't have to be in, on a battlefield. <laughs> okay. so what we find is the PTSD rates are highest among our drone, drone operators. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because of the moral injury. Because they can see with the cameras. They well, not see. only that, but they're and, not, and they're they're not, they're not right, they're safe. This is not, a, oh, this is not an equal battle. They're in Tampa, Florida. They've, right, they've, they've broken the warrior contract that uh, we'll meet on the battlefield as equals, oh, and both of us have a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, wow. And, they're, and they are, and they are often mm -hmm. killing civilians. What? They also end up having to kill, uh, killing civilians. Of course. Innocent people. That, you know, yeah. Women and children. There? Yeah. Um, one of the things that, to me, uh, we don't know how to deal with in our discussion about war and killing is that the images from the archetypal past are personal, they are embodied, they are face to face. Uh, you see the blood. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you have a sense of victory or defeat that is very physical and personal. One of the things that in my first day of uh, battle outside of Cologne, Germany, uh, um, I got introduced to combat with Germans shooting 88 shells at me. Well, they were shooting from about a half a mile away and these things were flying by me and exploding and I had this shocking realization these people are trying to kill me and they don't even know me <laughs> and it's so different it's so impersonal I directed artillery fire on German troops that were a mile away that I could see from where I was. 
And all I have to do is give them the calibration back at the artillery, and those shells started landing on, on the Germans. To say nothing of some uh, of my friends who were 30,000 feet in the air dropping bombs. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, in Japan, when the uh, bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, 80,000 people died instantly. Uh, that mm -hmm. we don't mm -hmm. we don't have a concept, a an image, a we don't know how to contain that kind of uh, mass murder. Really, yeah. Kate's father is a World War II veteran. He was a combat engineer. Uh, he was with the invasion force going to Japan. Uh, he was saved by the drop bomb being dropped, so he was in the occupation forces. And as an engineer, he was bivouacked just a few miles from Hiroshima. So he and his unit went through Hiroshima shortly after the bomb was dropped. And he witnessed all that destruction. We're very grateful there isn't cancer in the family. He's 94 and still here. As he's dying, he's on hospice, Pretty much the only memory he talks about is going through Hiroshima and how it shaped his life. Wow. And now he's telling us, I changed my mind my career. He was going to be a, a scientist and an engineer. I'm not going to contribute to building any machines because they might be used against people. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also, moral injury, he also has wondered, shared with us, I'm not sure I have the right to be alive. Because if I, my life was saved at the expense of 80,000 Japanese lives, I love my life, I love my family, I love my wife and daughters, but maybe it's really wrong for me to be here. So he's carrying moral injury to his grave. And that this is how these, it, deeply these issues affect us. And when we're working with veterans together, this is where we have to go. Into these monstrously difficult questions and struggles. Yes. Is there a vision, uh, a future vision of how um, there could be a time without the kind of war that we have now? Is it, or, or, and can we have a future the way it is now going? Uh, and what does that say about the archetype of war? Do archetypes change? Is there a mm -hmm. shift somehow? Uh, those are wonderful questions. Can you hold them for about a half hour? So let's get through the underworld and then talk about <laughs> how to transform it and our experience of it. Yeah. But um, I'm with you too. That when once we start to contemplate it, it's so urgent and so painful that mm -hmm. I want to get to the healing also. But a little while. Yeah. But yes, there is, and there are some countries and cultures that are doing it correctly and aren't at war and don't have PTSD. So we'll get there. Oh, okay, break time. <laughs> All right, yeah, please, um, I have 2.30, so please come back at 2.40. So, yes, quickly. Just quickly. Just quickly. Last, yes. The archetype of war. Yes. We have the, the shadow on the other side. The, the mm -hmm. protector, the yeah. positive side, is for self-preservation, the preservation of the community. Yes. The preserver on the other side, on the shadow side, when we're faced with nuclear war, and we talk about Hiroshima, this is self-destruction. This right. is the destruction of everything. Yes. So those are the two poles of the archetype that are, are at work. And we have taken a journey toward this other pole, to where now the world sits in this, mm -hmm. in this tinderbox of it could all go. Yes. And so there must be some kind of movement. And it, it has to, according to Jung, it has to come from within each of us. This is not going to be solved by politicians. No. We're going to have to face the shadow within right. ourselves and grapple right. with it. Each right. one of us. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, where we are, where are we? Um, and I did warn you, I'm not going to get to all of my materials. So, I'm, I'm going to. I'll skip some stuff, but we're, we're all engaged together. Anybody recognize this, the symbol, the mandala? That's the core of the cherry blossom. 
The American military totem is the screaming eagle. That's one kind of archetypal energy. Anybody know which warrior group chose the cherry blossom as their archetypal? Yeah, the samurai, right. The cherry blossom is the archetypal totem of the samurai. <laughs> be sweet, have that hard nub inside, but be sweet and gentle and realize and be awake to what you're doing. Yes? Because everything is transient. These cherry blossoms are going to be weak. Yeah. Louder, sorry? Everything is transient. Yeah. Yes. Yes, everything is transient. Mm -hmm. If you're taking a life, it's just that individual manifestation, but we all pass. And the warrior is joining the transient flow, actually, in an ancient way. They tell us that in Vietnam, too, when we say we grieve your losses, the Vietnamese say, but that was, the, that was karma. That was my son's karma. That was my daughter's karma. That was my family's karma. It's okay. You were messengers of karma. We'll get there. Okay. So, we are, again, looking at the archetype of war, and we realize that, in fact, war is a sacred arena. Geronimo said this, from the moment the command for war is given, everything takes on our religious guise. The Apache people had two languages, one for peacetime and one for wartime. Everybody spoke the war language, not just the warriors, when the, the warriors were out. So that everybody in the community always remembered it every minute, that our people are at war. And it has to be in that archetypal dimension. So if you're hunting small game, your arrow is just an arrow. But if you're fighting another warrior, your arrow is a sacred missile of death, as an example. We are in that archetypal space when we're fighting to take life. So I want to tell you a story. Um, and this really demonstrates the wounding of the archetype and its healing. Um, meet our dear friend Will, the man in the middle. Um, Will is Kootenai Native American. He lives on the um, Flathead Reservation in Montana. Um, Will, it was, this was this, a piece of his story in Vietnam. Um, in his very, he, he was raised in a traditional way. So he was raised with the spiritual practices of hunter and warrior. And he knew that it was a sacred act to take life and that you had to be responsible for the soul and the spirit of the life you released. So he went to Vietnam. And he was in his first firefight. And he, and as he tells the story, he and a Viet Cong veteran saw each other and they both stood up and raised their rifles and they looked into each other's eyes. And the Vietnamese man raised his rifle and didn't shoot. But Will was first firefight and everything was floating around him and he was scared and he shot and he killed the man. One thing he says is, I don't know why and how this is God's plan, but that man let me live. Somebody chose, some force chose to let me live. I'm responsible for this life I was given. Well, he went up to the fallen soldier and he took a pouch of sacred herbs out of his pocket and he started to chant and pray for the man's soul while so he was passing over. And a sergeant came up to him and bashed him on the helmet and called him dirty names and ordered him back into the unit. And we don't do that kind of blah, blah, blah stuff here. Will betrayed the sacred warrior lessons that he grew up with. And he had severe PTSD, and he was always in trouble with the law on his home reservation. And in fact, when he wanted to come to Vietnam with us, he was on parole. Huh. And we, this time the government did the right thing. We had to talk to the parole board, and they said, we don't know what to do. He's not supposed to leave the county, let alone the state or the country. They kicked it all the way up to the state level, the Department of Corrections, and they said, Please take him. We don't know what to do with him. Get him out of our hair for a month. <clears throat> okay, so we'll worry. So we went back to Vietnam together, and we went to the same battlefield together, and we found the very place that he fought and he killed. And right there, then, what, 45 years later, he finished the ceremony. We had a pipe ceremony. He had the sacred ceremony for the soul he left behind. Vietnamese people who can't even speak English, this was really in the boonies, came and saw us praying and joined us and hugged him. 
and finished. And from anguish, he started smiling like this for the rest of our journey. That was in the middle of the journey. And this is in Hanoi. By the time we got to Hanoi and we had a meeting with uh, North NBA's North Vietnamese Army veterans, and these two men were in the same battle. These people were trying to kill each other. Look at him now. And now back on the reservation, Will has become the war dance chief. And he's working with the surviving World War II and Korean veterans to learn the old ways so he can pass them on to the young people who have to go into service. So they're prepared as spiritual warriors first. Like your son. Prepares a spiritual warrior first and carry those values into action. And people say, what happened to Will? He's so happy now. And he is. So, where he will, I'd like us to look at the archetypal conditions of trauma. <coughs> Just, want to say something? Uh, Just <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry, I missed. I can't say one thing. Now. See any good opportunity? Um, we we all have a connection to the warrior, but, and I think that was the initial thing I brought up. Everybody has a responsibility for what happens. And even if you weren't in combat and you're supporting a person in combat, talking about this stuff makes you realize that, like, I played a part in this, too. I feel responsibility for the person who was killed, or the civilians that were killed, you know? So yes. there's, there's a piece of that responsibility before we say, hey, let's go bomb Syria, or mm -hmm. let's go, you know, to the next war. We, we aren't scot free. We aren't able to sit in judgment of the other person mm -hmm. because you're just as responsible as they are, you know? Yes. Thank you. This belongs to all of us. And the cultures that do make it belong to everyone don't have the PTSD epidemic that we do. We're dumping it on the veterans so the rest of us can feel clean and free and innocent. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dave. So, are the archetypal conditions of trauma? This is a trauma is a profound soul wound. It's an ancient Greek word. It, um, it meant being penetrated by violence, by the violence of the world, whether it was a sword or a spear or a rape or um, wrong action. All of those are forms of pen penetration by violence. So these are the con archetypal conditions of trauma that recur in all forms of trauma, but are especially evident in war trauma. First, everything is ultimate. Everything. Life and death, here and now, good and evil. I might not be alive in the next second. Everything is ultimate. Um, Ernie Pyle was the famous war, uh, war correspondent. We went everywhere, the troops, and he wrote back from the front lines, war makes strange giant creatures out of us little routine people who inhabit the planet. We are in God places, and we are in God powers, and filled with them, <coughs> and struggling to survive them. Also, it's a death rebirth initiation. Becoming a warrior for millennia has been the form of initiation for boys to become men. It's still initiatory, even if uh, we're not conscious of that. Many men who didn't serve in the military don't feel like they're uh, mature, initiated men. And look, look for alternative service. Um, and it is a one-way journey. People are changed forever. So when somebody says, can't you keep me back, the husband or the wife or the son or the daughter who left? Well, we can't. We can't. And as healers, we shouldn't try to. We have to keep moving forward into that um, returned honorable warrior identity. Um, it is really, we don't have to say more about this, you've all said it, and Thayer said it beautifully, We're re it's really hell. It's really a descent into the underworld that humanity creates. You know, when, when Sherman said war is hell, uh, he also said these other things. War is cruelty and you can't make it gentle. Uh, and he preached against war for a while after the Civil War. Don't do it. Don't give in to that power. Um, but then he fell again and became an Indian killer. So he didn't free himself. More archetypal conditions. We talked about the essence, kill or be killed. You're really not thinking about politics. <laughs> 
and I'm thinking about why you were sent there by your government. Okay. Um, and we're talking about killing. Uh, I do highly recommend um, Brian Turner's book. It's called Hear Bullet. It, he was a good poet before he went to Iraq. So these are poems right out of Iraq. And um, in one of his poems, well, killing another human being is the most painful act we can do. And then one of his poems, no matter how much adrenaline pounds through your blood, no matter how hard your heart is racing, no matter how much you want to uh, get revenge for your buddy's death, no matter what, no matter what, no matter what, my friend, it should break your heart to kill. Some warriors retain their humanity. Marina's son did. And so he reduced killing in the battlefield. But many warriors can't, and we don't prepare them for the killing that they're going to do. So it breaks them. And we become agents of death and destruction. And we become, and death and destruction become more familiar to us than love, than friendship, than beautiful tree outside. More archetypal conditions. It is an essentially moral arena. We can't escape the fact that death and destruction dealing is inherently moral and spiritual. We are facing the ultimate forces of good and evil. And we are given that power. We take life. We decide who lives and who dies. Scripture says, Oh, that's not ours, that belongs to the divine. But we take those powers of the divine without preparing our young warriors. So ultimately we have to, this is a profound moral and spiritual journey, and we have to well, develop an enlarged vision and identity that can carry it. And Thayer is an example of this also. He keeps telling us his stories. He's given a lifetime of service. He's still doing everything he can to reduce the impact of evil in our world. So this calling never goes away. And we have to remember this. Homecoming is a source of trauma in our culture. Not in all cultures, not if homecoming is done right. So I was in Seattle in October and I was working with a, a veteran group and there was a woman that, bless her, she was Salish. The coastal Salish people. So she was raised with spirituality, as we're saying, before she went to war. She was a nurse in Korea, in, um, in the front. Um, she said, I spent more time in the air than on the ground in my year in combat because I was the nurse riding those gurneys outside the medevac helicopters. When there was a wounded soldier on the gurney, I was on the gurney straddling him tending him and trying to keep him alive till we could get him to a mesh unit. That's what I did for a year. Okay. Did it mess you up? <laughs> As I was flying home to my home airport, I looked out the window and I saw my tribe down below. And I saw that they had formed a huge shield for me and my totems were in the shield. They were all waiting for their woman warrior to come home. And when I landed, four medicine men and women came and took me. They said, daughter, you can't go home. You can't go home now. You have to come with us. And they went into the wilderness for a month. And they said, we are going to take the war out of you before you come back to the village. So the war, you come home, but the war doesn't. And they have profound, complex ceremonies for doing that, which we will get to soon. But she's fine. She's good. She's an elder in her community, like there is an elder in ours, able to carry it. Without that, homecoming is a monster source of trauma. And many, many veterans will tell us, I knew war was going to be terrible. I knew I was going to hurt. I knew I was going to see death and destruction. But I thought my country would, and my people, my family, would be there for me when I got back. The trauma was home, the neglect and abuse uh, and negative judgment I got, not in the combat zone. That's really common, and it's a major problem. And when we keep saying, what's a traumatic event? What's a traumatic event so we can, you can apply for your disability? 
and people aren't really allowed to talk about homecoming and say, well, America's my, coming home to America was my biggest tragedy. Uh, and many people, like St. Francis, will re-up. I'm not home here, people don't understand me, I don't know where I belong, but with my battle buddies in the zone, I know exactly who I am and what I'm supposed to do and who's for me and against me. So we have many people re-upping over and over again rather than coming home, and of course the suicide rate. Part of the suicide rate is veterans saying, this country is not the one I was fighting for. What this country has become is so horrible, it causes me so much despair that I'm checking out. So warriors also have to not only believe in the cause, but believe in the place they're fighting for, and believe in how it evolves and what they're coming with. Yes, Maria? You know, the only man <clears throat> that my son lost was through suicide when he came home. It's the only man he lost in his whole service. Mm -hmm. There we are. And he also was the mm -hmm. one who looked in the eyes and took the gun, pointed the gun out. And he created peace with, between the Sunnis and the Shias. Mm -hmm. He did amazing things because he was able to understand what he was really doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to hear the presentation from you and your son. Mm -hmm. But does everybody hear it's possible? It's yeah. possible to be a spiritual, a, a true spiritual warrior with a moral and spiritual base and go into that zone of hell and do the right thing and preserve and protect and bring reconciliation rather than destroy. And we have a living example. What's his name? Eric. Mm. Eric. Eric Nelson. And Eric Nelson is a living example of a spiritual And now he's going to be a psychiatrist. So. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And we all know psychiatrist means soul doctor, right? <laughs> Psychiatros, soul doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Whoops. So this is what we're not going to talk about today. <laughs> this is what we're all taught and all exposed to and is the dominant um, uh, philosophy about PTSD and God bless everybody for trying hard but we're not pathologizing, we're not diagnosing, we're looking at this instead. Traumatic experiences transform everything about us and we all hear about the broken brain and what um, the, the changes in the brain from, from violent trauma cause, and that's all true, but it's only a piece of the story. Um, and Kate offered to you earlier that uh, there's no PTSD in Vietnam. Uh, there isn't, that's true, I hope I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, but we bombed Vietnam so severely, eight billion pounds of bombs dropped on that tiny country four times the tonnage of bombing in all of World War II, all over the world, on little Vietnam. Mm -hmm. That would be enough to get every single person survivor in that country PTSD if it were all broken brain. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Not there. It's not there. There is some traumatic brain injury, but there's no PTSD, no chronic shattering PTSD like we have. So we have to look at why. But all of these things are affected by trauma, not just a broken brain, but every aspect of our body, mind, heart, and soul. So our relationships, our personal and community relationships, our identity, our philosophy, and morality, the way we live in our bodies, our place in history and culture, everything has changed and everything has to be addressed for transformation and healing from trauma. And so I want to get to the good healing stuff. So when we look at PTSD, we all remember the monk painting, the scream. PTSD is the soul screaming. It's screaming, it's anguish. And we know this as archetypalists, that symptoms are the soul's language. They're not to be eradicated and erased, so we're comfortable. They're to be embraced so that we evolve and see, we hear what they're telling us. I've shared with you that my back is wrecked. Well, I'm working very hard to hear the archetypal messages and it's changing my whole life mm -hmm. and my identity. Um, and I don't necessarily like it. <laughs> Mostly I don't. It's been good to me this afternoon because of, we're in community. Um, but we have to deal with all of these dimensions um, and address them uh, for archetypal healing. So, 
so we get to the hopeful stuff. So we're talking about uh, the, the breakdown of the, um, and the misuse of the warrior archetype in so many ways, in training, in action, in, uh, in the cause, in the experiences in the combat zone, and experiences coming home. And remember, Sitting Bull in the Lakota said, the spirit's left him. Healing is restoring the spirit, in our psychological language, restoring the archetype. Uh, can you see that picture pretty well? No, not very well. Uh, that's also in Vietnam, um, and that's Terry, bless him, he just died two summers ago. Um, Terry's soul left him on the battlefield, and we went right back to the battlefield, and you grieve there, and you see uh, in the midst of our ceremony where he had he hadn't cried in, since Vietnam. His heart was numb. He really had that terrible symptom that we call psychic numbness that is so troubling. He couldn't feel a thing uh, until we did a war dance together and it broke through and broke open. And then we went to Vietnam together and back to his old battlefield. And it all came out. It all came out in a beautiful healing ceremony right where he had fought, right where he could grieve his fallen man, and right where he had felt his heart shut down and his soul left him, it all came back. So, from being in his third marriage, alienated from all his children in a school dropout, when we came back from Vietnam, he reconciled with his family, he healed his father relationships with his kids, he finished a master's degree in English, he started creative writing groups for veterans, he corresponded with Vietnamese poets, and they were um, pen pal buddies. Uh, and he, most importantly, he had, he, you see him grieving the men he couldn't save, but he acknowledged that he tried to save everyone, and that uh, he would leave no men behind. He didn't leave any bodies behind. He made, made sure everyone was fallen, got out, so there were no MIAs and no MIA families from Terry. And finally, instead of, I was no good, he went to, more came home because of me. More came home. That's what he's saying in this foxhole as he's crying. And he adopted More Came Home as his spirit name, as his warrior name, after our ceremony. And then the next night he turned 65 and we had a wonderful party for More Came Home. So, how do we make it right? Well, we don't... We, Bleh. We need to do this, and we don't as a culture, but some do. We're here, and this is the lesson of the buffalo. The Lakota and the Cheyenne, the Plains people, of course, for them the buffalo is sacred, and the buffalo gave them everything, their food, their tools, their shelter, their clothes, their weapons, uh, their medicine, um, their spirit. And they studied the buffalo to learn how to live well. This is one of the things they learned about buffalo, and from mm -hmm. buffalo. When everything is quiet and peaceful, there are no predators around, the buffalo just spread out on the plain, eat and play and butt heads, uh, and they're kind of random and scattered. When a predator arrives, human or animal, two-legged or four-legged, the buffalo spontaneously do this. They push the cows and the calves, the women and children, into the center. The cows push the calves right into the center and make a protective circle around them. Hmm? Yeah, as they're running, as they're fleeing from the predator, they're making these protective circles. Then the bulls surround the calves, uh, the cows. Then the old bulls go out into the outside and surround all of them. The young bulls, so there's concentric circles. Old bulls, young bulls, cows, calves. Old men, old warriors, new young warriors, not experienced, the mothers, the women, on whom the society depends, and the children who are the future. The old bulls are willing to sacrifice themselves first, obviously. So, Dick and Thayer and I would be on the outside circle, right? We have the most experience so we can lead our people to safety, but we're also old and used up and we don't reproduce anymore. Maybe. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so we're so most, the most expendable. When a, bu uh, a buffalo is wounded from any one in the circle, they all push the wounded animal into the center so the whole community carries them along. And the community gives the wounded one the energy to survive. So then the plains people tried to replicate this. And whenever the warriors went out, and we should all think this way now, they're forming a protective circle around the community. Unfortunately, our government says the whole planet has to be surrounded, but mm -hmm. we won't talk about that. The warriors are still going out to protect the rest of us, and many people who sign up really believe they're doing that uh, and feel good about their service. The circles are supposed to reverse, and that's what traditional cultures did, and that's what we don't do. When the warriors return, then they are brought into the center of the community and all of the others, all of us surround them and protect them and preserve them and give them everything they need for as long as they need in order to come home and heal. Our warriors do the first one and our society does not do the second. So there is a broken social contract between us. It's not true in every culture, but it's very true in ours. And our veterans know it, and boy are they angry. And then, any veteran anger is an expression of their soul. It's not a symptom of PTSD to be eradicated, but throw them in jail for trying to express it, which is what happens. Okay, so that's the lesson of the buffalo and why it's important to us. And we actually give people two paths home. We expect the veteran to turn into a civilian again. And every and most of our healing efforts are to recreate a civilian identity, and that inevitably, um, not for everybody, but often inevitably uh, creates post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic growth and spiritual development means you're a veteran forever, you're a warrior for life, and we help them and we honor you as evolving into an elder and a spiritual warrior. So there is a growth trajectory home uh, for doing this. Traditional cultures have had it. So back in the archetypal world, this is really important, this quote from Joseph Campbell. When the symbols provided by the social group don't work, or when the symbols that we think work are not of the group, the individual cracks away. If we're not talking about warriorhood, if we don't understand the military, if we're not giving them images and symbols and stories that are consistent with the archetypal warrior, we'll lose them. And most of what we try to impose in psychology, not out of malintent, but because people don't know, they're not initiated into military and warrior ways. Most of what we offer does not match the phenomenological experience of the veterans. We have to learn their world. What we're usually trying to do out of compassion is pull them into our civilian world. We have to go into their world. We have to go into their world. We have to be the bridge and go into their world and walk in their world with them, with the right stories and images and intent. And then we become battle buddies in the journey home, and it works. And you know, another one of our archetypal teachers uh, said it in a different way. The immune system accepts or rejects what it needs in accordance with its innate needs, this is James Hellman. <clears throat> the material must be integrated into the carry. The material must be accommodated to the form. It must become me. If we talk warrior imagery and warrior legacy, that's me, that's who I've become. If we talk, no, this is PTSD illness, you have to become a civilian again, it doesn't fit, it's not consistent, it doesn't give them a growth So, since we're stuck with the acronym PTSD, and, oh, I recommend to everybody to go on, uh, on the internet and look up George Carlin's uh, five-minute stand-up comedy routine about PTSD. Has anybody seen it? Okay, yeah, right. Go see it. I'm not going to imitate him. It's too good. But Carlin was an Air Force veteran, and he was really angry at the military and that's some of the source of his 
sarcastic humor. After the first Gulf War, he was so angry about how veterans were being treated that he added a, a stand-up bit about PTSD. Um, so check it out. But we had the acronym, we're stuck with it. Everybody knows it, it's in common speech now. Everybody walks around talking about my PTSD. Yeah. Um, so if we're stuck with the acronym, I've translated into other more perhaps useful terminology. Post-traumatic soul distress, and all of the symptoms are the soul crying for attention and expression. And post-traumatic social disorder, because we're not making the buffalo circle, and we're not giving our people what they need to come home. And whenever a society is using most of its resources, like 75% of our national budget, for destruction, that's social disorder. So collectively and individually, nationally and locally, we're in social disorder. We've all got it. Our society has the wound. And our veterans and others are just manifesting what's going on in the culture. And one more PTSD. It necessitates post-traumatic spiritual development. We have to, have to, have to be on a path of higher spirituality and morality to be able to carry this material well. Um, we all, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to skip. Okay, so, um, Kate and I have, <clears throat> as you've heard, worked ooh, on this for 40 years. Um, we've worked very hard to understand and, and grasp the entire journey that our warriors go on and to offer some guidance, and so, uh, well, this is uh, what we've come up with after all these years of work as our transformational model. This is a map of the warrior's journey. And we all remember, of course, the mythic journey, that uh, the hero's journey Joseph Campbell mapped out for us. So we have the departure from whoever we were before through answering the call and leave-taking and getting assigned and going overseas. The departure from the ordinary, from the predictable, from the conventional. Uh, and we plunged into the underworld for the underworld journey and the initiation where we experience horror and fear and guilt and shock and power and intensity and we may become berserk, meet the beast inside us. We also have brotherhood and sisterhood and great mastery of, of, of our skills. So this is the departure of the hero's journey, the underworld in, uh, immersion and initiation and then the return. We take leave of our community, of our brothers and sisters, and we try to come home with grief and loss and culture shock and all of the difficulties that that creates. And then we have to struggle to make meaning, find spirituality, and fit into the community again. So that's the return journey. And if you remember, Joseph Campbell rightly said, remember, which is the par hardest part of the journey? The return. The return, yeah. Why? I just want my husband back. He's different now. What? I don't want to hear those stories. They're horrible. I hope you're doing well. Have a cup of coffee. I'm not going to sit and listen to you. And it goes on and on and on. I thought my war was the war to end all wars. Most warriors come back feeling that way. This should never happen again. But it does. So the return is the hardest. The community hasn't changed. When we have changed radically, yes, they. I can't tell them because they'll harm them if I tell them what happened. That's right. So that's the fallacy that, yeah, but you're not protecting them. You're, you're transferring your stuff onto them whether or not you tell them or not. And they don't know why. So right. it's a trauma in itself that you're perpetuating in your family. Right. Yes, thank you. Everybody get that? Warriors are still trying to protect us by not telling their story. And actually, as they said, soul, it brings a trauma. Your soul will still transfer that rage and that pain and that yeah, anger right. that without the story. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, one thing that's occurring to me that I had not thought before. I was in World War II. The nation was deeply involved, as were other nations. Yes. 
<coughs> Rosie the Riveter was putting together planes. Everybody was on food stamps. Uh, in one way or another, the whole population of the United States was engaged in the war effort to a greater or a lesser degree, but it was part of their consciousness. Mm -hmm. And when we came home, which took us quite a while, there were millions of us overseas, we came home to a nation that had participated in the war in their own way. Yes. And it was a war of necessity. Uh, it was totally different than Vietnam or even Korea. Yeah. Um, you know, it, uh, the warriors' return in those wars especially with Vietnam, he came back to a hostile country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 1968, uh, the uh, election, uh, there was enormous rage and rebellion. That didn't occur with us. So one of my curiosities, and I don't know whether anybody ever did a study is whether there was as much PTSD after the Second World War as after Vietnam, Korea, etc. Maybe you know that. Um, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd have to look it up, but Psychiatric casualties in war, there were more psychiatric casualties in World War II than men killed in action. I know that. Um, of course, people were taken off the front uh, and given you know three days of bed rest and medications and food and then sent back to the front. So there was a lot of breakdown from the severe combat, but people were recycled and they weren't uh, usually released. Uh, and Eisenhower after the war said the greatest mistake that we made as Americans about World War II was not providing enough money and resources for mental health services for all the shattered soldiers coming back. So I don't have the numbers, I can look up the, yeah. the comparison of psychiatric versus KIA, but um, your point is really important and yet it's also true that People were kept in the zone beyond tolerable stress. Military psychiatry has stress units and used to keep those numbers on World War II soldiers and said that universally after so much combat exposure, everybody will break down. And that's been well researched. The only type personality type that doesn't, you know, is yeah, sociopathic because they're at home. We want to understand the sociopathic personality in, in a world, just imagine the combat zone. Oh, they live there all the time. So yeah, there was, um, there was a lot of psychiatric breakdown in World War II from the extremity of it yes. uh, and the longevity of it, but not the same as um, what you're sharing about feeling abandoned and betrayed by the homeland. That didn't happen in World War II, but has happened every time since. So I'm going to add homecoming as a source of trauma. It's more than that, and you're right. It's uh, support from the nation during service and homecoming as sources of trauma. Can I make just one point yeah, here? This is a political point. In the Vietnam era, uh, up until the Vietnam era and the Vietnam War, we were citizen army. Uh, mm. To go to war, you were conscripted into the army, and citizens served. In the Vietnam, there was such fierce uh, resistance, even in the troops who were conscripted, first lieutenants were shot in the back of the head rather than follow the, these guys down into the jungle. So the military came up with a solution, all-volunteer army. Sounded great at the time. The all-volunteer army is a mercenary force. Mm -hmm. He stride the planet. So yes. these traditions yes. that we have, if we talk about warrior, they, in my, in my sense, they don't apply, but when you're talking about a, 
a mercenary army yeah, that is right, right. very well endowed and you know oblivious to any 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 uh, semblance of moral discourse. Thank Andrew, you. I want to say Andrew Bakebit uh, in uh, Betrayal of Trust explores this in depth. Mm -hmm. It's a very important point. Mm -hmm. It is, and. Um, Working directly with those people, I want to affirm what Bud is saying, that uh, they know they're mercenaries. They don't feel the support of the culture at all. They know they're a different group. And, in fact, they do model themselves after some of the spiritual warrior traditions in order to keep themselves strong and centered in their warriorhood, but not asking about the morality of it. So, for example, um, there's many examples, but... Uh, in October, I worked on um, Fort Campbell with our the Airborne Rangers. They call themselves the Legion, like Roman Legionnaires. And they carry imitation Roman Legion swords. And they use the same uh, model as the Legion did uh, that, to preserve the Republic. But that's not what they're doing overseas. But they say to themselves that they are. I mean, they all identify together as modern legionnaires. So they are trying to use some of the spiritual traditions, but when we look closely at them, they're also warping them. And because of that principle of selection, uh, the volunteers, who's liable to volunteer for this kind of right. service? It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the psychopaths that are inclined to, to want to do this. Who else would volunteer? Uh, people who are... Poor, 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 poor. Yeah, right. yeah I'll, I'll never go to college unless I go to the military. Even, even amongst no that, it's, it's, you know, it's the poor kids without the poetic sensitivity. Either. That's right. You know, that's, that's true. Sorry. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's accurate. Um, the head of psychiatry, Kate and I were working at um, Walter Reed, and we are talking about this with the head of psychiatry there, who said, this vision of the spiritual warrior is wonderful. And we officers have read our Shakespeare and our Homer and Bible and studied this, but how do you bring it to all of our young recruits who haven't graduated high school, <laughs> who don't say hello, goodbye, please, and thank you? The military has become a corrective socialization institute for broken children mm -hmm. rather than an institution for evolving high learning. Mm -hmm. You're right, and that's a huge social problem, so now we're back into our social problems. Yes? yes? But I think just to follow up on your comment, and I think maybe what you're saying also, is that it kind of wounds the archetype. Yeah. The archetype yeah. can't have the power it had in ancient Greece and Rome and in Shakespeare's time now because of the fracturing of our culture. Yes. It's perversion rather than yeah. perversion. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. The perversion or the fracturing or the right. fact it's become mm -hmm. so wealthy kids don't go. Mm -hmm. College mm -hmm. graduates don't go. Yeah. I just, if I could just yes. make one more point. How many presidential elections have we had in, in your living memory where our, our foreign wars weren't an issue, weren't discussed? Yeah. Right. That is the obscenity of our democracy. That is our yeah. shame. Yes. 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 Not even mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to point out the dark side of training warriors using mythology. The SS officers in Germany were trained in a castle with all the Templar rituals yeah, to, to bestow them with power. Mm -hmm. That's right, and they had a code of honor, and honor they were striving to live up to. Yeah, so right, when we're talking about archetypal material, let's remember it's also very dangerous. And it's so empowering, and when it's used in a skewed way, it creates, successfully creates monsters. Yeah, yeah. I was saying that uh, I work with that. One of my clients has uh, basically talked about meeting more paganism while he was he was away, yeah. and his platoon basically stylized themselves as basically preservers. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And to them, that was a goal and an honor rather than a, dis a horrible distortion. Yeah. yeah. That's what we're doing with the arc. Okay. So, the full warrior's journey. So, um, Thayer, thank you. Thayer has done the full warrior's journey. And Thayer is... <laughs> you gave me permission. <laughs> okay. 
All right, but briefly, let's just look at a few of them. They have shared all of these stories with us, and so they, the individual warrior's story becomes the tribe's warrior mythology. We're a community. He's our elder warrior. His story belongs to all of us to learn from and to pass on. So he did the whole thing, and these are only a few moments, but the departure crossing the threshold from ordinary to into liminal space, not only boot camp and being drafted and being trained, but they are, went across the ocean uh, by ship, at night, in the dark, alone, contemplating mortal morality and mortality, and changing forever the dark cro crossing over the river Styx. <laughs> the river into the underworld, except he didn't listen to the gods, he remembered everything. Yes. Didn't forget. So he crossed the threshold and had the night sea journey that changed his life and he realized he was in a liminal world. Everything's different here. And down in the bottom is initiation. He had many experiences, many of them, uh, including what he shared about directing artillery. So becoming the agent of death and destruction is one. Uh, he met the beast. They were told, shared the story of guarding alone as a young man, guarding four SS prisoners, and knowing that if they wanted to, they could kill him like that. And he had to, he was facing the beast and had to deal with getting through that night. Uh, and he shared our, his concentration camp liberation story in that moment where the prisoners screamed freedom, death and transfiguration. <laughs> Seeing and facing ultimate evil, knowing he's a servant, trying to resist that evil, and then having a blessed vision from a denizen surviving hell, blessing him and praising freedom and teaching him why he was here. <laughs> and then the return, as we all know and experience there, has led a life of moral and spiritual service, seeking to redeem that encounter with evil. And, as the Bible said, he's actually made... Oh, uh, you make sacrifice for surviving. And service is sacrifice. And his evolution into it, our elder spiritual warrior. And as we said, the warrior's stories are our warrior mythology, and so he belongs to our community, and his stories belong to us, all of us, to learn from and remember and pass on. So we're talking about reconceiving trauma, not as a pathology, not as a pathology. Trauma is a tragic reality. Remember Buddha, he simply said life is suffering. <laughs> life is suffering and it's full of trauma and it ain't gonna go away. It's a tragic reality, it's a universal force, the archetypes are alive in us. And we have to do the work of, of transferring information, positive experience, and to learn from it. So, trauma, violent trauma, can be a portal to the liminal. We're no longer in Kansas. <laughs> and it's a rite of passage, transforming us from innocence into experience, learning what we're really made of, all that we're really made of. It's an initiation. We go from boy-girl to man-woman. We go from novice to warrior. It's a call to the real. Oh, the bullshit of life really doesn't matter when you're living in warriorhood. No, I really don't feel like going to the mall and shopping this weekend. That's not what excites me. Um, I worked with one, one of my early clients who was uh, nothing worked. Uh, he was drugging, he was ruining his job, he was ruining his marriage, he's looking for the kick, and nothing worked, and nothing worked. He finally was divorced and still destroying himself. He finally took up skydiving, and that was it. That was it. He learned to skydive. He ended up skydiving every weekend or, or in the good season, and he said, free falling a mile 
gives me the kick that I was looking for that I only experienced in the zone. Yeah. And now I can feel it again. And even though I've broken a couple of ribs and arms, I don't care. I don't drink. I don't use drugs anymore. I've got a good marriage and I can get my thrill. So again, we have to look for the experience and the imagery that matches the need, the soul need. Um, the real call to destiny. Uh, War shaped Thayer's life and he's been serving as a healer ever since. Kate's father said, my destiny has changed from, from my encounters out there. I'm somebody else. I have to do something else with my life. Trauma calls us to our destiny. I'm only doing this work because I'm very traumatized, of course. <laughs> uh, including the war traumas. Um, and it's a call to community because we are serving the community and we can't come home without community. And bless our, all of us, our counselors and our, and, and our VA hospital and such, but it's separation from the community. We eventually need to be out in the community sharing our stories like Buffalo and like the Plains people. It belongs to everybody. And there is revelation, that moment that the, the survivor fell at Thayer's feet and cried, Freibet. That's a revelatory moment. That's the divine speaking through our suffering. And um, there are many, many, many stories I can tell you about the spiritual breaking through um, under these horrible traumatic conditions. I'll end with one of those. Okay, so this is important. Um, is there hope and is there healing? Is there a path home, we wonder? Uh, and it's not only about honoring and understanding the archetype, but there is. There is, there is. Since wars have been with us forever, of course, there must have been uh, other societies struggle with how to bring their warriors home and restore them into the community. So Kate and I have spent these decades studying other cultures, traveling to other cultures, participating, we're both initiated um, in the Native American medicine way, um, going to Greece, going to Vietnam, everything we could do to study the warrior tradition and how to respond to it and how to bring warriors home. And what we've been able to do is abstract all of the practices, like Joseph Campbell abstracted all of the, the myths of the world to show us the hero's journey. What we've been doing is abstracting uh, the warrior teachings, lessons, rituals, and practices to understand the essence of them so that we can offer the roadmap for the warriors and also um, for the healers to follow. So what we find when we look at world warrior history and the history of return is that there are six core steps that are necessities of return that traditional cultures do in different forms and different order, but they all have them. Modern cultures do some of these sometimes, but when we do these things, we can bring, restore the soul and shrink the trauma so that the, the identity can carry it without collapse. So the first one is isolation and tending. Uh, and, um, well, in the Bible, Moses ordered that all Israelite soldiers coming back from every single battle had to spend a week, a week in a camp outside the village with their priests going through intensive purification and catharsis. You can't bring the war home. You have to be healed of it, just like um, the Salish nurse. We have to take the war out of you before you go back. Otherwise, you'll bring it home. And what will we get? Substance abuse and um, marital difficulties and child abuse and all the problems we have. Cost the war is all being brought home. So isolation and tending is a first and essential step. Um, World War II had some of it spontaneously because there were millions of people and they came home on troop ships. They could hang out and they could talk and they could have beer and they could tell their stories and they could laugh and they could cry. The Navy has started bringing some people home from the Middle East by ship again. And it's working better. With nothing else, other change but that, those troops are, are doing better coming home. Um, and of course, our survivors will isolate themselves if we don't give it to them. So we've heard millions of stories. We know people, um, you know, my, my son's living in the basement. My daughter won't come out of her bedroom. 
Um, I'm going off into the boonies to live in a, an old trailer. We have settlements of veterans in the boonies all over the country and overseas who won't come out. They are isolating and tending themselves because we didn't. So isolation and tending is the first essential step. Whoops. And affirmation of warrior destiny. All right. The Plains Indians had a new warrior teepee right in the middle of the camp. And when somebody came back from their first battle, they were put into the new warrior teepee. They were tended by the medicine men and medicine women and elder warriors. And sometimes they couldn't even touch their own food. They were fed by others because they were full of war poison. In some traditions, they stayed there for a, a prescribed amount of time. In others, they stayed there until they could take this next step. So what affirmation of warrior destiny means is this. The elders would say, did you not wish to be a warrior in your people's service? They have to be able to say a clear, calm, deep yes. If they scream, yeah, 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 let me out, I want to kill some more. Nope, you're not ready. Or if they say, no, 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 I hated what I had to do, I hated it. But you did, you're not ready. You stay in isolation, we'll keep telling you. And you could say a, a deep yes to the experience and that my destiny is being shaped by it. And okay, then we can move on. Um, so affirmation of destiny, and we work with our warriors to do that, not to help them become civilians again, but to affirm this different destiny. Uh, purification and cleansing happens in many, many different ways in the warrior traditions. As we said, Moses ordered it with um, fire and water to clean, cleanse your weapons and yourself. And the Native Americans, of course, have sweat lodges and vision quests and other intensive purification practices. Um, in Africa, uh, some tri traditional tribes bury the warriors in the earth up to the neck and leave them there for days for the war poison to leach out. And a fire chief who was at 9-11, who I know, <laughs> lives on Long Island, he was at 9-11 for many days when he finally came home and drove into his driveway in a comfortable middle-class neighborhood on Long Island and got out of his car in his dirty, stinky uniform and his wife came out to greet him and he threw his arms open and she said, no, don't touch me, don't touch me. Strip right here, right now. In the driveway? Yes, those clothes aren't coming into the house. Strip here. She had a plastic bag. I'm sealing it up so this stuff doesn't get into our family. Get upstairs into the bathroom and take the longest, hottest shower you've ever taken in your life. And clean yourself. Purify yourself. And I can't wait to hug you. And he did and they did and she did the right thing. He was okay. He's okay. They're okay. So purification and cleansing is critical. Storytelling, we've had some of it here. Thank you, Thayer. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, warriors who are here. Storytelling, and of course, therapists. Storytelling is critical. Um, brief therapies that say you don't have to tell your story. <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> That's lobotomy. We'll take your stories and throw them out and just treat your symptoms. Okay, so um, storytelling is critical. Of course, therapy in our culture is a way for storytelling. It's, and we look for necessary and sufficient conditions. It's necessary but not sufficient because we finally have to get out into the neighborhood, into the tribe, and tell our stories in our houses of worship, in our community centers, in our schools. We have uh, the Veterans Education Project here where warriors are going Traveling around, and we have some. Pete, any other VAP speakers here? Yeah, we, or volunteers? Thank you. So Veterans Education Project gets veterans from our community to go into the schools, just tell their stories, educate our children. Another reason Vietnam doesn't have PTSD is because they've been doing that literally for centuries, sending their warriors into the schools because there's so many invasions, they knew they would have to prepare the children for them, and so they're not shocked. They don't like it, but they know what to expect. So storytelling has critical, critical um, use to the community. Uh, restitution in the community means two things. Um, one is, 
um, that the warrior who has feels like he or she has harmed has, gives, does good, gives good back to the world in uh, response to um, the harm that's been done. We were sitting in Vietnam um, in a conference with a, a, an elder monk, the uh, head monk of this pagoda, and some of our vets were in deep grief about what they had done during the war, and this beautiful man just went up to the, these two vets who were crying, and he put prayer beads around their neck, and he hugged them, and he just said, Oh, my brother, if you feel like you made bad karma in the war, then all you have to do is love everybody and make good karma. <laughs> That's restitution, giving back. We've built two schools in Vietnam, and we've done many, many other things. And we always have our veterans present the charity, so they're making restitution directly where they are. And they come home smiling. Restitution on the other side from the community is buying back the veterans and taking responsibility. Uh, what we do at our, warrior, at our healing retreats um, is uh, all of... The circles, we put the warriors in the center and the civilians community surround them. And we say to the warriors, you served in my name, you served to protect me, even if the war was illegitimate, you went and served to, for our preservation and protection. We sent you, we paid the bills, we're responsible, we willingly take the burden of responsibility off you and willingly put it on our shoulders to carry. And when that happens, we just all fall into each other's arms crying. Always. And the veterans really do feel that horrible weight is off them. That's us. It's our responsibility. And that's restitution. And in traditional cultures, uh, one became an elder warrior only after going through this whole process so that you could carry warrior responsibility and action and memories and feelings without collapse. So what happens is we grow the soul really big and restore the spirit, so the trauma gets proportionately smaller. We all know that with, when we're dominated by trauma, when we're in the wound, it seems like trauma is our whole life and shapes everything. We're reversing that. The spiritual warrior archetype dominates and shapes everything, and trauma becomes the way you got there, your story. Finally, veterans who are really suffering can simply say, it's just my story. There are many, many practices um, that we have um, for achieving this that I'm not going to go through now because of our time. Um, but there are many practices. They're in my books. We can, I'm sure some of you use some of them and we could talk about them outside. Quickly, meet Mr. Tiger. Oh, he was 97. He just died last October. But we visited with him every, every visit. Um, and he called our vets his brothers. Uh, he was in combat for 25 years. Never paid, never a professional soldier. He fought against the Japanese, the French, and the Americans, all invading his country. And these are some of his lessons that he said to us. I know you veterans have PTSD in the United States and suffer terribly because there you think the wound is here. But here in Vietnam, we know the wound is here in our hearts. And we just love each other back then. Mm -hmm. And our vets complain, you were in war for 25 years, you must have terrible survivor's guilt. So many people died around you, warriors and civilians, and not you. And he gently said, no, I feel sorrow, not survivor's guilt. Their karma was to die, my karma was to live. And who knows, maybe, maybe we have the harder time living with this, remembering and carrying these feelings, and we pray they're okay on the other side. But, Mr. Tiger, you killed, you killed, I killed, I can't stand it. No. Two soldiers faced off. Each were armed, each pulled the trigger. One fell, one lived. We don't determine that. That's everybody's karma. Life is so complicated and all the forces come together at the same moment and we have to accept the karma <clears throat> and that the bullet is the messenger of karma. Yes? There's a beautiful picture from Old Norse culture of two warriors standing at each other intertwined by a knotwork pattern. Mm -hmm. They saw that it, and they believed strongly in karma and fate. 
Yeah. Ew. This is just ew. One of us is gonna have to go. We don't know who's gonna be. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. And then I heard some of you chuckle, so you must have read his yeah. last statement. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, how do we prevent it? Well, stay home. Stay home. <laughs> but then he said, if what we said earlier. He said, if another country invades you and it's bombing your schools and killing your children and you've tried everything to stop it and there's nothing else to do, then it's right to take up arms. It's the only time it's right to take up arms. We don't have PTSD because all, I didn't even think I was fighting Americans. I was only trying to stop invaders. And I didn't let that pollute my feelings about you Americans. Why is it older than to learn from? And they really mean it. Please keep bringing your veterans back so I can heal them with my love. They mean it, they do it. They practice it for us in ways we've never seen in this country. So, is it possible, uh, is it possible not to have PTSD? I think we could share a whole meeting together and why there's no PTSD in Vietnam and what all the social and cultural and spiritual forces are. We don't have time for that today. But these are a few of the core principles that are built into cultures that don't break down or that gentle the trauma so their people aren't shattered for life. Truth telling. What are we doing to who, why? Tell the truth. What am I serving? An absolute, as we said, an absolute unquestionable moral necessity we're taking life and destroying homes and families. It has to, has to, has to be absolutely necessary and right with no other hope or chance. Uh, we need moral, spiritual, and community preparation in advance of service, during the service, and after conflict. The country and the warriors have to be united or there will be the horrible collapse that we have. And what we call the communalization of trauma. Um, we have two other wonderful uh, experts in this field in our community. Um, I hope some of you know them and their books. Jonathan Shea now lives here. He just retired here. His books are Achilles in Vietnam and the Deceased in America. I invited them both today. They couldn't make it. Um, and Bob Marr, Robert Emmett Marr. Uh, his books are, well, just came out, War and Moral Injury. Um, He's, he's, uh, he works at the VA, he teaches at Hampshire College. He's a humanities professor, and he, like me, is bringing the humanities to this work. Um, he's got some really important books. Killing from the Inside Out. Uh, he also translates Greek poetry, so we have that connection. It's wonderful. Anyway, uh, those two are also leaders in this field nationally, and I wish we could get all three of us together. But uh, Jonathan Shea was the first to coin the term moral injury in Achilles in Vietnam. And he also coined this term that we're using today, the communalization of trauma. The communalization of trauma. That's what we're talking about. When all of us carry it together, when we don't see the trauma as belonging to the individual and uh, pathology breaking down that individual, rather an inevitable transformation from service in the zone of hell that we're all responsible for and we all find ways to carry it through ritual, through holidays, through stopping business as usual, through memorializing, through giving purpose, all of it. We have to communalize. And we have to give transcendent meaning and purpose to it. If what I've done is for somebody else's oil field, that's not going to wash. <laughs> But if I had to save my child from rape, maybe I can handle it. I can carry it. <sighs> and the community has to change. For me to go through such profound changes and come back and everything is just going on as it was before and crazy and worse, um, there's no community response. It's horrible. I don't fit in here anymore. It doesn't make any sense that I experienced that and you aren't affected by this experience at all. So we have to change that. And, you know, we're in the age of globalization. So it's all our story and it's a world story. 
one of the Vietnam veterans, uh, Vietnamese veterans we always visit, said to us, from now on and forevermore, Vietnamese and American veterans must be the lips and the tongue of the same mouth telling the world the same story. Beautiful and wise, and that's where we're trying to evolve. So really, we can bring it home, and some cultures do. Communalizing trauma, overcoming the outsider and victim identities, and all of us getting into this process together, <coughs> serving as an elder, as Thayer does, and the rest of us recognizing and honoring and using the elders, uh, embracing our transformed destiny, bearing witness, telling the stories, talking about this, making this urgent in our culture, um, helping the wound become meaningful. Helping the wound become meaningful. I went to Vietnam and I just destroyed, but I've got, I'm helping an Agent Orange family now. I'm helping preserve their life. I'm restoring life. So, um, responding directly to the wound with something that heals it. Uh, and bringing it into the world through action, not just hiding out with what we've been through. And we restore the world, and we really can. We really can create elder warriors. And we have to work with the elder warriors and work with their disciplines that are good for all of us in order to help keep them serving as elder warriors and not collapsing. And none of these are pathological. All of these are positive psycho-spiritual means for healing, for staying on the path, and for keeping ourselves together after we've been in shattering places. So, Jung didn't write a whole lot about war, but he did write some. Uh, and, of course, we could study the explosion of the unconscious on a massive cultural level that he exposed and complained about, and um, how powerful those collective unconscious forces are in humanity around the world when we don't deal with the issues and so they finally explode on us. So he wrote about that and observed that in World War I and in World War II. He even dug up some of his old World War I writings when World War II erupted and just put short footnotes like, the same all over again, just worse. So uh, we could go there, but I picked out just a few of his conclusions about our nature. As we call this warrior wisdom. All of our warriors come back with wisdom. Hopefully they go away with some wisdom. My friend Dick Olson here is a wise warrior who was in the army protesting the Vietnam War. It was in 1965 you wrote your paper? Oh, later than that. Later than that, okay. okay. 70, 71. So while the war was going on, and while Dick was in the army, he wrote and circulated a paper entitled, Wild, Why Vietnam Will Win the War. Uh -huh. He knew, other people knew, and we wouldn't admit it and deal with it. But um, um, some people go in awake and aware and try to serve as moral warriors from within the system, even with the hell going on around them. And I'll always honor you for that. And this man too, Peter Blum, was in the Navy during Vietnam. And here's a form of resistance. I will gladly serve my country, but I'm not going to fight in that war. That war is wrong. Military service is right. Loving my country is right, but don't ask me to use it in the wrong way. So he actually achieved the unusual, um, the unusual achievement of becoming a conscientious objector within the military and then being released from his commission uh, with no problem that he didn't have to serve something he didn't believe in. So it's possible to go in and to be awake and to find a way to do the right thing. And so as Jung reminded us, the world wars are such invasions of the unconscious, they show us how thin the barrier is in us and how much we have to safeguard it. How am I to love the enemy in my own heart and call the wolf my brother? This is not going to answer that question, it's warrior wisdom. I'll tell you one more story and I'll close down. Um, that, that's Ron. This is Ron also. This is Ron's story. 
how is this possible? Combat becomes the most, horrible combat becomes the most important spiritual experience of your life. Okay, Ron was an APC, a, a, an armored personnel carrier driver. So most of these are the big, horrible, clunky, heavy um, machines that carry troops inside and um, some personnel sit on, on, on the top. So Ron was the driver and the machine gunner on the top, and he was in a group of six APCs when they got into a very severe firefight in the jungle, um, in Tainan province, west of, of Saigon. And this was the experience he described. Rockets and mortars and bombs and grenades and bullets were flying all around me, and I was in my APC firing like mad, trying to save myself and my buddies, and suddenly, my soul left my body. And it rose up and went into the tree that was over my head. And my soul watched the battle from above the whole time. People were wounded, people were killed, it was horrible. I was watching my own body down below, fighting to survive. And when the battle ended, it came back. It came back into me, and I kind of woke up and then I saw the destruction after the battle, but I was okay. Um, the other experience he had, which I should have told first, is that um, before this battle he was driving his uh, carrier th um, through the jungle and, and the villages, and he was ordered to drive right through people's gardens, their rice paddies in their gardens, and destroy their crop. And he didn't want to, and he argued with it. We can go around, we can go down the road. And his CO was preserved and ordered him to go right through, uh, right through a, a dike and destroy an old woman's garden. And she was standing there watching. And he did it, but he was looking into her eyes as he was destroying her livelihood. And that was a horrible, horrible soul wound. So he did that, he felt that, and then he had this battle of experiencing his soul go out. Well, he's lived with this for a long time, but what he's done are these practices. He's a serious meditator, he's a serious student of spirituality. He came back to Vietnam with us. Um, this is a little woman, is Madame Key. The battle happened right near her house. She invited us in. Her own brother was killed in that battle. Ron apologized and she said, no, it wasn't you. You didn't do it. He met his karma. It's okay. I love you. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ron and a, a medic Steve took the responsibility of creating a, a fund for her and we raised over $3,000 and built her a new kitchen. She, all she had was a plastic tarp behind her hut. She's now got a kitchen and a bedroom. Um, and there's beautiful, beautiful reconciliation. And Ron says, losing my soul during battle was the most important spiritual experience of my life. I didn't know I had a soul. I didn't know it was real. I didn't know it could leave. I didn't know it could come back. I didn't know it could keep me alive. I didn't know I needed it. And ever since then, I've been tending it and tending it and tending it with the utmost devotion. And so, I hate war, but I'm glad I had that experience and met my soul. And we could tell you many stories like that, but the point is that this is, we are in spiritual space, the archetypes are real, we really embody them, and they come to life uh, and break through us under these difficult conditions like at no other time. And so we have lots of work to do. Mm -hmm. Yes? It's just, it's in me to say, but. Um when you're talking about meaning making, yes. truth telling, which is important in order to form and heal the community, I'm wondering if one of the reparations or restitutions can be how do we go towards the war profiteers, the people who are making the wars, and that's our war, to call that our next war. <laughs> because, you know, to say, to, because we're dealing with not a community not with the protection of the community, as you've been saying many times. Right. So we, that's why we have the breaking of that archetype. It's very hard to even consolidate the noble qualities of the warrior. Right. Yes. Because we are not, you know, and so I think part of the warrior archetype is one that has a brain, meaning says 
this is not, like you say, many great warriors here who refuse to fight. Mm -hmm. I just think that, that part of the how to make meaning out of this is not just healing the past war, yes. but making sure the next war doesn't happen. Yes. And, and to see that, you know, I look at a lot of the wars as the elites um, trying to stay in power over their own countries. And the whole idea that we're fighting some other nation is a false flag war. Right. And so the real right. war that we have right now is the one percent and the inequality that's around the world and that needs to that's where the warrior's gaze needs to be and it needs to be intuitive and insightful enough to go in that direction. Yeah. So a few uh, North Americans went down uh, during Che Guevara's revolution and wanted to join and become fighters for him because I believe in the socialist revolution. And whenever a United States citizen came down and wanted to join Che, he said, no, I need you somewhere else. You live in the belly of the beast. Go back there and fight there. That's what's causing these problems, not down here. So thank you when you're right. And mobilizing as warriors for peace is really important. And many warriors do it. Of course, there's a wonderful organization, Veterans for Peace, that you might know about. I'm a member of some. Um, and they're doing what you suggest, and uh, there are other org veteran organizations like it, but we all need to mobilize together. And we're talking about recreating community. You're right, and the archetypes fall apart. Or they, they have their fun with us if we don't have community mm -hmm. to help hold it together. Mm -hmm. So thank you.